and 19 at half 31 p.m. And I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on traditional land for Ghana people of the Yellow Plains and that we pay respect to all past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with land and we acknowledge they are continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And also like to extend that respect to all our Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present here today. We um, don't have any apologies, but before I continue, I just need to... Um, The committee uh, open. Uh, yeah, the committee meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that any audio or visual recording has been taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and your contribution uh, to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed, or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside of Australia. Uh, we don't have any apologies, although noted councillor Canole was possibly an apology. He's with us. Uh, councillor Canole, you're going to be here for the rest of the meeting? Thank you very much. So if we can just change that. Um, I'll note that on the minutes. Can I have a councillor move the confirmation of minutes for the meeting of the 15th and the 10th and also the 7th of the 11th? Thank you, councillor Martin, seconded by councillor Kira. Uh, any discussion with regards to those minutes? Okay, be it that there's none, um, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, all those against, those are carried. Okay, item four. So um, we're dealing with item 4.1 first, Southwood Street and Movement Study. We have a presentation um, through the CEO, Shanti uh, Dita, who will be um, taking lead on this and introducing our speakers at all tonight. Uh, thank you. Through the Chair, um, we've got a presentation here for members to update you on the work uh, that's been undertaken over the last couple of months uh, on the South Ward uh, uh, Streets and Movement Study. Um, this work has been uh, undertaken on behalf of the Council by Colma Bruton and um, I have Sarah Zanka here from Colma Bruton to present the findings of the consultation that we've been, been undertaking. Um, in addition to that, um, I have Brian Rule here to my left. Brian is the project lead on this piece of work and will be leading it through council going forward. forward. Um, what I'll do is I'll hand over to Brian to just uh, uh, brief you as to the, the genesis of this work and um, you can then hand over to Sarah to present. Thank you, Shani. Uh, through the chair, um, so this project... So this project came into existence back in 2016 and was a motion on notice. Um, all of you will be aware of the North Adelaide Local Area Traffic Parking and Management Study, uh, which was undertaken a couple of years ago now. So the project methodology was based on the learnings of, of that project, um, but it was a bit more of a holistic review of the streetscape to take into account uh, the different design elements such as street trees and, and, and greening and furniture and whatnot, but also um, still covering off on those important uh, uh, subject, uh, topic, um, sorry, topic subjects of um, parking and traffic. Um, so jump to the next slide. The study area was obviously the south ward uh, proper, uh, but it didn't include the north-south corridors, uh, which deserve their own studies, which will be undertaken at a later stage if they haven't already been. Now I'll pass on to Sarah, who will give you a summary of the engagement and, uh, and the uh, results. Excellent, thank you. Um, so just over the page we've put a quote there that really accurately represents how people feel about the area. So we live in paradise here, the sense of community, the amenities, the location and the lifestyle paradise. Um, what was really important to us, if we just skip over a couple of pages, was to really get a good um, understanding and feel for the community's views of the South Ward. Um, and we did this through a couple of different approaches. Um, so we conducted a survey of the area, which was available um, online or on hard copy form. We tried to make it as accessible as possible. We received 303 responses to that survey, which was from a combination of um, visitors, residents, employers and employees. Um, that's a really good number of responses for this kind of area and it represents an error margin of 5.54%, which is quite an accurate or robust number. We also ran two workshops, one with businesses and one with residents, and we held them in the South Ward and people were recruited and invited to participate in those workshops. 
We also went to the people. So um, you can probably see in front of you on the screen there, we went to quite a lot of cafes, um, community centres and also Hound Wave, which was a puppy dog friendly event that happened in the South Ward throughout that engagement period. I'm going to show you now some of the key results from this engagement process. Most of the people we spoke with were residents at 65%, 29% were visitors and a smaller proportion of employers, employees and landlords. In terms of demographics, we've got quite a good coverage here. So 53% uh, females, 43% males, really good mix of age there, and also 5% use some form of mobility device, which was important to capture in there as well and represent in the results. The vast majority of people live or rent, own or rent in the area, um, and quite a long tenure of people who have lived in the South Ward. So that's over 50% of people have lived in there for six plus years, which is great. In terms of businesses, um, over the page, we look at how many employees they have and a bit of information about how employees and customers park. And I guess the key finding there is that most most are on street parking, which certainly plays into some of the results that you'll see shortly in their thoughts around parking. Uh, we also asked their main mode of transport and walking followed by car were the two most prevalent methods of getting around the area. The table, table on the following pages shows the priorities across the key groups that we surveyed. So for people who live um, and or own property in the area, more street trees and greening was the top priority. For visitors, it was the same, um, and also for businesses. What I'll do now is take you through some of the results across each of these different areas so you can get a feel for some of the nuances that exist and the community perceptions across these different areas. In terms of trees and greening, um, we've got some raw quotes there from people, so I encourage you all to have a read of those. There really was a desire for more trees. People talked about native trees to reduce the amount of watering required and kind of quite conscious of the environment and the climate. Um, they also loved the idea, which may contradict the previous point, about fruit trees or edible gardens um, as being really positive or really well received in the area. There was a huge demand as well for pedestrian friendly streets and footpaths. Um, so people who live in the area were really hot on it should be walking friendly and pedestrian friendly rather than car friendly. Um, they talked about wider footpaths, better quality footpath services and to reduce vehicle speed in the area as well. There's the last comment there on that page was someone who uses a mobile chair, wheelchair, um, and she just mentioned that there were some paths that have quite a large slope which make it difficult for her to travel on. Street art also came up a lot, particularly by residents and people who visit the area. They talk about it adding interest, creating a bit of a vibe, which is something that they were really hungry for in the area. Using local artists would also be really well received because it tells the local story. They're proud of where they live and they want to be able to celebrate that. So if street art is something that we can pursue, I really encourage you to find those local artists. We saw plenty of their work in the community centre. Um, that would just be fantastic. Parking, maybe not surprisingly, was quite a hot topic for people and it differed depending on who we were speaking with. So visitors and businesses want more, whereas people who live in the area want less. Um, the residents would prefer that the space is used for gardens to kind of beautify the streets um, or bike lanes. Businesses felt that time restrictions or a lack of parking impacted their business, particularly if they were in a service business where they had a client in for a couple of hours, so a hairdresser, for example, that was quite tricky for them. Um, and that was a perception for them as well. Um, residents without permits found it hard to park close to home and difficult for visitors. There was also the kind of commentary around every few hours they could see all of the workers come out and shift their cars around from their windows. So, a bit of a um, bit of conversation there on parking. Bikes were a really um, also interesting topic. So they wanted to see more improvements to bike infrastructure, both on and off road. Um, the most important part there was about having this balance between being safe for cyclists and pedestrians um, and then ultimately creating safer streets for all. 
The resident view again was about prioritising foot and cycle traffic versus cars. Our street furniture, really there was a desire for more here. So it was recognised that it's done really well in some streets, but there is opportunity to do this more in others. They talk about greening up median strips, pavers, footpaths, making it more appealing for the street view. And finally, another hot topic was e-scooters. Um, a lot of people talked about how great they are and how convenient they are and how it helps them access different parts of the city and the South Ward. However, there was also quite a few concerns around safety, um, particularly when they're left on the footpath and they fall over and they can be a bit of a hazard. So <laughs> they talk about it being an eyesore and potentially unsafe, but people really loved the idea of them. And as long as there was a safe spot to park them or store them, they were good. Um, a couple of other considerations to raise uh, is the public transport, so they felt that that could be improved, particularly the free bus service, so people talked about it would be great to put their kids on it to go to school, um, some people who lived in the area, so they thought that was an option. Um, and then also the Hutt Street Centre came up as well, so people recognise how important that service is, um, but it did create some negative views about the local area and thought that it could hurt in some way that Hutt Street precinct. Another comment of two came up around undergrounding electricity. Obviously that comes at a huge cost, <laughs> but people are just kind of giving us their wish list. Um, to wrap up, overall engagement in this process was really high. Um, our mission was to be where the people are and were, so we really hope we achieved that. Um, people are overall are really happy with the South Ward. They've lived there for a long time, they're proud of the area and they want to stay living there, but there are some things that they'd like to see council do um, and they really would like to see that happen. Top priorities were around trees, greening, pedestrians, cyclists and kind of the vibe or feel of the area and then there were some divided views on e-scooters and parking. So I'll hand back over to Brian now. Thanks, Sarah. So some really exciting things for us and we are just really excited to be able to start rolling or working with these sorts of, of, of results with some of our projects. So first and foremost, we'll report back to the steering committee, which involved the South Ward councils as well as the local business uh, and resident groups. Um, and then we'd be looking to report back to the community a summary of the engagement findings. Uh, then in terms of internal actions, we'd be hoping to develop a form of an action list um, so that when we want to do a, a renewal or new project in the South Ward, we're making sure that the designers uh, are, are taking into account these elements that the residents and businesses and visitors are telling us that they want. Uh, and then we'll look to, uh, once, once we sort of got that, that up and rolling, we'll look to round back with Council in April 2020 with the Council report. Thank you. And just to finish off, uh, members, uh, the material that we presented will make that available uh, tomorrow for members. Thank you very much. I'll open up the floor to councillors for questions or comments. Uh, Councillor Hyde will put his hand up. Thank you for the presentation. Very informative. I know a lot of work's gone into it today. Um, a few different aspects I'd like to touch on and query. This one might not be easily answered by you guys, but just generally to administration through the chair. Um, uh, E-scooters, we know we know them lying around as an issue. One of the things that we looked at with the license were parking zones for e-scooters. Could I get an update either from you or whoever about where we're at with those parking zones? Because that may easily address um, some of the problems around e-scooters lying around and what have you. Yeah, through the chair, it's a matter we've been discussing directly with Shanti this week about scooters falling over and what can be done about it. But Shanti, can you respond? Thank you. Through the chair, so I can answer that one. So I've been uh, uh, project managing the EOI for the scooters. Um, so as part of the EOI, there is a requirement that the scooter operators are going to be able to, to, to be able to install um, the property parking areas so that um, we'll be able to enforce um, locations for them to be able to park. Um, we will also be really um, heavy on uh, the promotion of, of new um, uh, designs in the, in the scooters. So at the moment, um, there's some technology that's being trialled with a double kickstand. Um, obviously, there are issues with people having to lift up the scooter to do the double kickstand, but um, uh, there's one operator that's uh, 
they think they've developed an innovative solution to that. So we'll be really excited to have a look at that. So there certainly is some, some nice and APM and that's first. Yeah, cool. And I've told the providers as much as well that they need, to, the stands are tiny compared to the size of scooter. And that's a big part of the issue. Um, uh, but I'm conscious that we, we put that parking stuff in the previous EOI, but, and we're currently, you know, we have permits issued on that EOI, but we're not, we haven't progressed to that point yet of having those zones or, Yes, with Jeff. So, um, look, it's a difficult one. We didn't want to prioritise the, the use of curbside space exclusively for e scooters, and that was sort of where we were holding off. Um, but we have recently signed an agreement um, with a new, um, uh, what do they call it, a shared mobility data um, um, analyst. Um, um, consultant that they will actually be reviewing um, densities of scooters around the city and we'll be able to use that to map out where the main densities of scooters are occurring and from that we'll then be able to look at potentially a dock system which we would round back with council before we obviously want to have anything. Yeah, fascinating. That's that's very encouraging. Um, and I'm guessing the way that that would work in practice is there'd be probably more so a price incentive for people to use the parking bays as opposed to saying no you can't stop anywhere in the city. Yeah, through the chair that would be correct, yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, that's good, so it's good to see, although there's a contention there, that's a nice way to be fixed. Um, coming to the disagreement on parking, but just before that, looking at the results and where the results came from. First of all, I think it's, uh, like I said, very good turnout, and we've had more people respond to this than respond to the North Adelaide parking review. So hopefully we'll avoid some of those um, mines there um, due to lack of consultation, but um, responses to the consultation. Um, but I noticed if you go back to the slide that breaks down where we got the responses from, it said only 2% of respondents were employers. Does that mean only 2% were businesses? Or, or, or are you, or are you, some businesses, are you counting them in the landlords or own property in the city because they own the premises they work out of? It just wasn't clear what the split of businesses versus residents. And so could you give me a figure of how many businesses out of those 300 responded? Uh, so. Is it? That's what I'm asking. Sorry, please. <laughs> no, that's okay. So through the chair, if we just jump forward one couple of slides to where the chart is. So this is just back one. Um, so where we talk to businesses, they could either be employers or um, employees. So you could say that four percent here represent businesses, um, plus the eight then that were involved in the workshop. So the kind of 4% of 303 plus the eight is a small sample size, agree? Mm. That, yeah, that is, um, I would say, unacceptably small mm. um, in order to say that this is an adequate representation of what the businesses think. Um, and I think that if you look at that, it may address that contention there with the parking. I'm not, I'm not saying I have firm views either way regarding parking. Mm. What I am saying is I'd like to have the information to make a decision and I just don't feel we have that information at the moment. Um, uh, while we're on it, talking about the consultation, when we first met the steering committee, it was decided that a consultation package would be posted out to all, all residents and businesses. Now, you'd appreciate that residents often have a lot more time to put into consultation and we thank them for it, we need it. Um, businesses are often very time poor um, and uh, unless something is put in front of them or someone directly comes and asks them, what do you think? Um, they won't be able to give you their opinion. Um, now, of course, we as councillors ask them what they think all the time, and boy, do they give us their opinion. Um, but unless someone's gone and done that, I just worry that that contributes to the lack of um, interest. Now, that consultation package, as I understand it, wasn't posted out to all addresses. Can you confirm that? Yes, yeah, through the chair, that was correct. We went with the DHL flyers instead of the the actual printed survey on the um, on the advice about marketing gen. Yeah, uh, I, I would suggest, uh, I'm not saying I'm going to move a motion to say this or something, but I would suggest um, to, to you guys and to the administration generally that in order to get those business numbers up and in order, well, we need to get those businesses business numbers up in order to make a proper decision on this going forward, um, that you might consider posting out to those businesses um, in South Ward to put it in front of them to see what they think. Um, uh, I, I think I think if, if this is going to inform, and I know the cost of post is dollar a letter plus a few cents to print stuff, but um, uh, if this is going to inform how we design multi-million dollar projects in half of the CBD part of the city in the square mile, then I think we need to get this right. Um, so I would just leave that suggestion with you guys. But otherwise, it's a magnificent body of work. Um, and uh, yeah, keep it up. Thanks.
Councillor Sims and Councillor Kerry. Thank you. Um, look, thanks very much for um, the uh, the work. I think it's really comprehensive and great to hear that some people in South Ward think it's paradise to live. I live in South Ward. It is a very <laughs> nice place to live. Um, I, look, I don't think there's any great risk that residents are being un, uh, that um, businesses are being underrepresented uh, by this council. Um, I don't think there's any risk that the views of businesses aren't being fed in um, on this council table. Um, but I'm interested to know how many um, businesses are there in South Ward. You know, we talk about them being about four percent of respondents. How much would that be in terms of the sample size? Because I wouldn't have thought there's a huge number of businesses in South Ward. I'm sure you know this, Al, but I'm keen to hear. Through the chair, I believe it was about 3,000 properties. Is that, yeah, that's what I bought it. So I, I, I think that there was a total of about 9,000 residential and 3,000 business, I think. Sorry, so, that's just off the top So of would my that head. be about like, right then in terms of percentages? I'm not a great maths person, or do you need to get a higher percentage of business respondents? <laughs> Through the chair, so um, no, so the, the, the business that, that, that is quite low, but I think it is just worth noting that we didn't include the north south corridors, which obviously all those corridors have a lot of business tenancies on because we felt that each of those corridors, they're, they're, they're generally, their issues aren't generally captured that well in an LATPM study and yes. they do warrant their own individual corridor studies. I think it is just worth noting that. Yeah, that's an important point. And look, I guess it, it, my feedback, I I think would be if we're going to do a mail out or, or have a specific engagement piece for businesses that we have to do it also for residents and um, because you know residents are also very busy and so if we're going to uh, follow that approach we need to be consistent um, but look I think um, it's a really good um, piece of work and thank you for doing it and, and particularly some I think very important learnings for us too around how we approach um, uh, our uh, roads, um, how we approach greening in the city, uh, looking at things like um, cycling and you know the need for us to take action on that because we've done nothing about it so far. So you know, a range of, of things like that that we can work on over this term. Councillor Sims, six and a half thousand ratepayers in the south, 1,700 businesses, 4,700 residential. Councillor Kerr. Thanks. Um, <laughs> thanks, Chair. Thanks again uh, to the report. Um, look, uh, can we can we skip back to the? I think it was the second or third slide, the one about the on-street parking, um, because we seem to race past it. And I didn't quite digest those numbers. Uh, we had a we had a survey response, and it was a ninety-one percent. Uh, request for more on street parking. Which slide was that on? That one, that one there. Oh, okay. Yes. All right. Um, so more on street parking. Ninety-one. So we got fifty-four percent of businesses want apparently uh, fifty. Well, fifty-four percent of the respondents and ninety-one percent want more on street parking. So you've got a you've got a vast majority who want more on street parking quite clearly um that cuts against i think your assertion that it's much of one and much of the other um thanks councillor sims thanks councillor sims um that that does i think that does cut against but uh, more importantly i i, I want to reinforce what uh, councillor hyde uh, has raised and, and councillor sims about us being extremely sure that we this is actually representative of uh, of residents and businesses, we've got very small numbers here uh, of the thousands of uh, respondents, and it is highly problematic to start extrapolating uh, from a uh, survey result of this nature, because what you end up having is those who will respond to the survey will have particularly strong views, uh, perhaps one way or another, uh, and and when when you have something that is quite that is so uh, discretionary uh, in terms of who responds, uh, you may end up with something that's really quite unrepresentative. So I will just echo the, those concerns. I'd love to see uh, some follow up, perhaps following up what Councillor Hyde has suggested on improving the uh, actual representation of this. Uh, so our confidence that this is actually representative and any further ideas that this is representative of, of actual constituents. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Any other questions? Thank you for that summary. Um, I guess I, uh, I don't disagree with the idea around business, except that I would uh, ask the question of administration in that I know when it comes to, for example, council elections, 
that the proportion of businesses versus residents who choose to vote at the same opportunity is, is vastly reduced. Do you know roughly what the proportion of people who vote is in terms of best businesses versus residents? Mm -hmm. Through Chair, not right. off the top of our head, we need to get that information. Mm -hmm. I know on that day that I was there with you and, and walked, mm -hmm. physically walked the surveys around to businesses you know, wanting to get their input, I would have taken that around to about seven businesses and only one chose to start to to engage with it. Um, so I think it's a valid point that they're underrepresented, but I wonder whether certainly handing them out, you know, it was a, a comprehensive survey and I think that that choice to, to participate is part of it as well. Regardless of all of that though, it is interesting to see uh, the data. Um, my question is, you said that this is going to be fed into ongoing processes and considered as part of projects as they arise, part of the survey included targeted information or the opportunity for respondents to provide targeted information on specific streets and specific issues. What has come from that? Thank you, Councillor Jonathan. Through the Chair, um, at this stage, nothing quite yet. So um, the consultant is still collating you've now finished collating all the individual responses. So now that once we receive them probably in the next week or so, um, we will then distribute them to the relevant um, internal parties within administration to make sure that they're either reviewed or responded to adequately. Mm -hmm. And is it anticipated that with the specific streets that may have been identified that there will be proactive responses to those in the sense that if, for example, one of the streets around the schools has been identified by multiple parties as needing uh, remediation in terms of safety and access for pedestrians, then would there be a proactive project put forward from those sorts of respondents? Through the chair, absolutely, I would expect so. So particularly if there was anything raised um, of a safety, safety in nature, um, if there's any risks involved in that, we would certainly be actioning that immediately um, in terms of the broader um, um, feedback that we get, um, obviously it's subject to the, the feedback itself, but we would certainly be reviewing it and potentially at a later stage it may form some board. And through the chair, uh, just further to that, so the whole point of bringing a report back into council is if there are substantial actions that are necessary is to get council endorsement for whatever they might be. And then looking at the top three priorities, more trees and greening, prioritise pedestrians and cycling and give the South Ward a vibe. You mentioned as projects arise in the South Ward, these will be considered. Is that including things that are scheduled imminently? Like are we going to say, all right, we know that there are certain streets that are due for renewal, so let's ensure that we put in more trees and greening, that we prioritise pedestrians and cyclists in these street renewals. Like, to what extent is this going to really drive change. Uh, through the Chair, thank you Councillor Donovan. So again, the April 2020 report will identify those things. However, where there is ongoing work that's already in train, um, where we will, where possible, pick those things up where it's viable. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Hyde, you've spoken. I'll pass on to Councillor Martin, then I'll come back to you. Um, look, I just want to reiterate um, what uh, Councillor Sim said, and that is that I think in North Adelaide we mailed everybody, businesses and residents, some 6,000 or 7,000 addresses, and I think it's necessary to do the same here, residents and businesses. I know there is a cost, and I know Councillor Hyde is concerned about costs on occasions, apart from trips to Sydney. Um, but uh, the cost is not an issue. Six six thousand dollars or seven thousand dollars for the potentially the information that it will yield is worth every penny of it. Um, and when we've got that information, uh, as a consequence of that, uh, you'll come back to us with some recommendations in April, was it? Chair, that's the intention. And then council will work on those. Uh, that is the intention. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll overturn those about September, I guess. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Hyde, you have a final question or comment? Um, thank you, Chair. Just picking up sort of on what Helen said as well. So you've, you've got 
you've got various schedules of renewal, asset renewal and works programs and whatnot. Um, will this, will the, will the study help sort of bump things up the queue a little bit? So will that then feature, because I know you've got particular timelines on when assets will reach the end of their lifespan and what have you, but if there's something, that, if there's two assets that are close to the end of their lifespan, one of them will last a little bit longer, um, uh, will you then factor in the community expectation that something is done and then use that to prioritise things, bump it up a little bit? Like how, how is this going to mesh together with your asset renewal program? Uh, through the chair, um, from an asset perspective, I think the feedback we've received from the community just reinforces the strategies we've already got in place. So essentially, we already have greening strategies, we already have um, bike and accessibility strategies. So I think it just confirms that for us. Councillor Connell. Um, so I take it this was, uh, uh, so as uh, you were interviewing all the various uh, people, um, is there, was there anything done around, they talked about, you know, very, very cursorily about, uh, uh, you know, getting rid of the 15 to 30 minute car parks, etc. Is there was any done work done around what is you know uh, then in regards to business because they, they each need a time for their you know the people whoever whatever they frequent uh, that was adequate to service the, you know the need of that business and that uh, that relationship was anything done around that as well you know to say you know, now you know two hours or whatever. Thank you for your question and through the chair, uh, not to that level of specifics, it was to kind of get an understanding as to what their thoughts were on the current um, setup. So not specifically. So going forward, would there be something more around that? Because I mean, obviously, uh, as for all the good intentions that were, you know, the, you know up north, it, it still didn't reflect what people needed, what, what the, many other people needed. So will that be part of the next stage, saying, okay, here is, here is the, the, you know, the variety of, of businesses that are here that require people to park, uh, on, in a sense, on street, um, you know, so that you do get a much clearer uh, vision of what is acceptable and what is it was to say, what is commercially, you know, a, a number that they can they can work with. Thank you, through the chair. So I think the north-south corridor studies would bring out some of those elements that you were touching on. Um, this project, uh, it wasn't delving down. It, res residents and businesses and visitors, visitors were welcome to provide that sort of detail if they'd like to, um, but it didn't specifically focus on that, that level of detail. Um, so I think those north-south corridors would certainly be the, the studies that will bring out, flesh out those details that you were talking about. You know, or is it uh, that in the, if you're at the uh, continuing uh, you know, engagement, that, that's a question, what is the time? What is it that, that uh, works for you? Only because one is about, I'd like less of something, but what is it that'll work? It's just that make sure you're doing appropriate numbers because that dictates on how many people can park and all the, you know, the, the, the turning over of the car parks themselves. Councillor Donald, have you had a final question? Yep, just a final question um, about car parking. Um, I know we spoke at some stage about investigating more um, innovation around uh, enabling car parking and looking at alternatives in terms of things like the Park Hound app or looking at um, uh, parking that's currently commercially owned and enabling it for after hours access where it's sitting there empty. So looking at some more um, non-standard parking options and also looking at the reality of perceived versus actual need of car parking. So there's a perception versus reality. Um, did you look at those within the study and did you also within was part of the parameters to consider the uh, actual parking need versus perceived? Thank you through the chair. So at this stage in the project, we've only consulted with um, the community. We haven't fleshed out that sort of detail yet. Um, again, uh, I'll have to look through the individual comments. I don't re uh, recall seeing um, any requests, like, like I think the numbers with, with residents not uh, not requiring it, not, not requesting additional car parking spaces. Um, you know, there, there was very few comments that, that I saw uh, requesting those sorts of facilities. Um, I think again in the north-south corridor studies we may see more of that sort of detail come out, um, but as part of this piece of work um, I didn't see any, any comments really. So included in this work will there be analysis of actual car parking requirements, actual um, movement of pedestrian cyclist cars or is this only seeking feedback? Um, 
through the chair, um, thank you, Councillor Donovan. We will need to understand um, the detailed feedback, and then we will work internally with all of all of the teams within council to understand what other work might be happening as well, and that would then inform potential other work that might be necessary. So, this it's it's important to note that this. Uh, material that we're presenting tonight is really the preliminary feedback from the consultation that's been undertaken recently. Um, we need to digest, understand it, and then determine what else we need to do. So, so the last slide that um, Brian had um, on there that said about the internal work, so we've got more work to do, which is why April might sound like a long time away, but we do have a lot of work internally to do to understand what else we need to do. And that would include, I presume, things like looking at the smart parking data, looking at the existing on street and off street potentially parking availability. Yeah, looking at potentially. Okay. Thank you, councillors. Any other questions? Just got a quick remark to. Uh, Possibly Chancellor or Clinton, just with regards to the scooters, and I've heard something about docking, potentially docking solutions, so which means they could potentially charge on the street. Is that the outcome that potentially may happen, or we're we talking about a physical dock without a charge? Through the chair, so there are a number of technologies and, and options available for docking. Um, one is certainly a physical dock and that would charge the scooters. Um, and I know some of the operators are very keen on that because it means they, they obviously don't have to pick up the scooter and charge it themselves. Um, but uh, if there's a physical piece of infrastructure that would be on the street, which isn't necessarily ideal. So um, one of the easiest solutions is to do what's called geofence, which is essentially mark out an area and you'd promote um, e scooter users parking with the scooters in that area. The reason I just wanted to mention is that there's, I know a few models um, internationally where potentially there's a dock and charge. Um, if council is starting to consider this, and this is to you, uh, Clinton, as part of our rollout of Capital Works, and we've got mobility solutions, especially with 10 gig um, and potential charging points, there's also a revenue opportunity there for council because you're reducing significantly the cost to pick up, charge, maintain. So I just at least want to put that on your radar so it's reflected through our fees and charges if it's something we want to consider uh, for council later. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Martin. Uh, just taking up your point further, I did read about your comments about uh, e-scooters um, and your concern about them being left on footpaths. Is it also within your thinking that there should be some sort of means of dealing with that, whether it be an encouragement, a penalty or whatever? I'm happy to talk about it offline. Oh, no, I, mean, I just read you say that in the news. Yeah, I think everyone's brought up the issue of them tipping on footpath and being left as a problem. So I definitely think that needs to be remedied. But if we could use proactive means, then reactive means of fines and make sure people do the right thing, that would be great. Thank you. Councillors, thank you. Um, any further discussion with regards to this item? Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, next item. We're dealing with item 4.2. We'll also have a presentation for discussion with councillors. 4.2, meeting schedule options. And I'll hand over to the CEO. Thanks, Chair. Rudy is going to lead us through initially with this. Thanks, Rudy. That's Rudy. Thank you. Through the Chair. Um, so uh, you've uh, seen in your meeting pack today uh, the presentation slides. So basically, the currently approved council committee meeting schedule is coming to an end uh, in December 2019 and uh, we will be seeking approval from council on a new meeting schedule uh, which will be coming to committee on the 3rd of December followed by a council decision to be got from the 10th. Um, this session really is a workshop to get some views from you, hear your feedback. Uh, the questions are listed in the presentation um, uh, provided tonight uh, around what do you like about the current meeting schedule? How could the current meeting schedule or structure be improved? Um, it's important to point out that there is no best practice model out there. Every council is doing this in a different way. Uh, it's really what works for you uh, as individual members and, and as the elected body collectively uh, to come to informed decision making. So that's really the key, what works for you. Uh, we'll be listening to your feedback and that will then uh, inform a recommendation coming to committee and then to council. You finished your uh, 
Uh, councillor, so this is open for um, dialogue. I've got Councillor Martin's hand up and then Councillor Sims. Um, yes, um, look, I'm uh, happy with uh, this schedule. I had uh, expected that we might see some substantial change, but uh, the, the only change I notice is that some committees are scheduled for 6 p.m., some are scheduled for 5 30 p.m. Is there a reason for that? Are you referencing councils or committee? Or yeah, no, uh, some committee. Yeah. For example, September 15th is 5.30 p.m. Uh, April 21st is 6 p.m., yes. Yeah. yeah, and it's a, a bit But it might be just a typo carried forward. It's so just a typo? Yeah. Okay, so committee remains at 5.30, council at 6. Correct, so I should add uh, through the chair that what uh, you've been provided uh, with so this calendar um, example is just uh, going on the assumption of no change. So basically what we've had currently rolling over. Excellent. Thank you. Look, I, and I think this all looks fine to me. I do note there's no meeting scheduled for Melbourne Cup Day, Tuesday the 3rd of November. Is there a reason for that? Um, through the Chair, so um, the previous uh, council approved meeting schedule equally had no uh, meeting provided for for that night and we just went with the assumption of no change rolled it over as was uh, just for the example here so uh, i propose that we uh, meet on that evening as we would ordinarily and um, what's the best process for me to do to advance that proposal we just the give best, you a feedback uh, at the moment council let's just right. feedback okay. there'll be an opportunity at committee to look at what the uh, administration will present to council <laughs> And then a committee that could be endorsed or amended, and then you'll have an opportunity to get a council to this. Okay. Well, I, I urge administration to um, not uh, make allowances for Melbourne Cup within our meeting schedule. Um, it's not a public holiday, it's a normal work day um, for most people in the community. Um, and uh, there's no reason for us to not meet. Um, in fact, I, I think it could be seen as um, council giving tacit approval to Melbourne Cup event, um, one which I I think involves the exploitation of animals and so it's not um, appropriate for us to be changing our schedule to accommodate it. Thank you Councillor Sims. Councillor Moran. Yeah, on that, why couldn't we just, I mean, it's not not really our um, tradition to do that. We did it in response to a specific couple of events and um, yes. we had really no problems with it before. <coughs> I'm happy to have Melbourne Cup day off, but I do see the point now that it has become a little bit on the nose racing. It's not like it's the Adelaide Cup, is it? It's the Melbourne Cup, for God's sake. Um, and uh, so just for the new members, we used to always meet on Adelaide Cup day. This is only a very recent thing. So there's not, you're not breaking a tradition by um, bringing it back. But the other thing I wanted to um, just ask, the far, I remember when they, I think it was before you two or some, um, when we brought the five meeting Mondays or Tuesdays. Council meeting used to be on Mondays in those days, um, and not that long ago. Um, and um, Susan Law, um, her motto was, when I cut down a council committee or a council meeting, it's a good day for me because I don't like you. And, but, uh, so she actually belligerently brought in um, the five Mondays in a month. There's no rhyme or reason. No other council does it. I mean, I'm happy to have a Monday off. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, but now it's a Tuesday, but it was a Monday, which mm. Tuesday makes it less likely to have one. But there was no rationale or anything like that. It was just a really crazy CEO um, that did a lot of things like that. Um, I'm not looking at you. She, she was <laughs> um, unbelievable person. Um, and she said that about herself, so I'm not surprised. She said, I am. I'm the craziest CEO in here. Um, and she cut down a lot of the. A lot of it, so, so, anyway, uh, to, just to, to say to the other councillors that knew, that is, not, that is not a tradition either. And no other council does it, and I think it, we, we miss a step there, really. I'd rather, my, my preference is always for um, more shorter, more handleable meetings than sitting up, you know, for your eyes are on the back of your head. 
Um, so I don't see the rationale for having that uh, anymore. But I, I'm not going to go and change this. I'm happy with the current situation. Um, and um, that's fine. Thank you, Councillor Moran. I've got the Lord Mayor. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd, I'd like to suggest something a little bit different that we could try um, open for discussion. Um, there are currently four meetings a month and a lot of our meeting time is taken up, no offence to the administration, but with the workshops and the presentations that are sort of the strategic parts of what we're going to do in the future. And so mixed among, so even tonight, uh, among the um, the items that are going into council, we've got a whole lot of workshops and presentations. And I would suggest that if we looked at the four meetings a month and the first meeting of every month, or however we want to do it, is strategic workshops. So things like uh, a lot of the big discussions that we are doing, you know, um, even around things like Adiad O'Connell or, um, the presentations that we've got coming up around visitor information centres or whatever would all be done on a Tuesday. So strategic matters and workshops. And then the committee, which would go back to the non-decision. So this is informing discussion, looking at the work that's coming through. So this is all future, future work. And then the committee meeting could be informed. So it isn't um, formal in that we make recommendation, but that would marry with the agenda going into council. So that this is information on the agenda items that are going into council. So the two mirror, and then of course the council meeting. That leaves the fourth meeting to be open to either do more strategic work, if that's what's on our agenda, or to have a special council meeting or to have another committee. But we've got the fourth one open because as you've seen from the work that's come in this year, there's times where we actually have to do a lot of after hours weekend extra meetings. So for instance, when we're doing budget, we would use the strategic meeting and probably a second meeting in the month that is specifically focused on budget. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the time, it, it would become very sort of streamlined in terms of um, workshop strategic uh, committee and then council and then a fourth one, whatever we allocate a fourth one or what. Um, I also checked in with the other Lord Mayors, because uh, through the Capital City Council with Lord Mayors, just to see what was happening. Um, Melbourne does two what they call future Melbourne committee meetings. They've also got planning, so they have two future Melbourne, one council and one planning, which we have cap. So that they do their planning as a council, so we have cap at Plur Reconciliation. All those meetings are in addition to this, so audit committee, etc. Um, uh, Sydney has the same. I think Sydney had two. Uh, they have a separate setup. They have four different committees. So they have environment planning, um, culture, and corporate finance that all meet uh, once a month. And then they have one council meeting. Uh, Perth has committee and then uh, one council meeting. Um, so I just wonder if there's, I'd like to throw that in there as a discussion or something that we could have a look at as a different way of structuring the work that's going through. I'd just like to say too that I agree with that because I think the, the way these are structured are mucky. You know, you've got council-based staff, then you've got a, a workshop about something very uh, amorphous and weird. So I've always agreed with Sandy on that one as long, as long as we've done right. meetings, yeah. So, uh, Lord Mayor, you finished? <laughs> okay, so I've got um, Councillor Sims, then Councillor Martin, then Councillor Hart, and then Councillor Bernstein. Thanks, um, Chair, and thanks, Lord Mayor. I think it's an interesting um, suggestion. Look, I'm definitely um, open to looking at the um, how we can make the committee structure more effective in terms of having the strategic um, planning kind of session within one committee. I wouldn't like to see us lose um, a council meeting though within um, the month. Um, we did have a resolution of, we, we did have a, um, a resolution of uh, council a little while ago, um, which I think was an amendment to a motion from you Councillor Martin or you, um, Chair, which um, committed Council to maintaining the frequency of the Council meetings as part of this um, workshop. So I wouldn't like to see us having less Council meetings during the year. Um, I think for me that the Council meetings are really the conduit between 
of the community and uh, the council. They're a really important accountability measure. It's the way that the community knows what we're doing. Um, and it's also the way in which we can um, provide guidance and uh, strategic leadership to administration. And I worry that uh, less meetings means more power to unelected officials uh, to make decisions. So, and I mean no disrespect to um, our administration when I um, when I say that, but you know we are um, elected to provide a strategic political leadership to the organisation. Meeting regularly, being able to put motions on the table is an important way of doing that. So, uh, yes, happy to look at the idea of um, maybe trading off one of the committees. Uh, in, in the cycle so that we have a, a broader strategic planning, but not uh, at the expense of um, one of our monthly council meetings. I don't think Sandy said that. No. Um, um, I didn't say that specifically. I said that fourth one could be it's as we option. need it. Yeah. So if we need a second council meeting or special council meeting, we'd use that. If we needed a another strategic planning workshop, we would use it for that. So it's a matter of, uh, streamlining how the work comes through, uh, but we'd know we'd always have those three, and then the fourth one we'd schedule yeah, as so we need. Think, yeah, what, what I'm hearing Sandy say is that we're leaving that one open to what we need to fill it with Correct. rather than miss one out. So, just to yeah. provide clarity for everyone, what the Lord Mayor suggested is please correct me if I'm wrong one strategic workshop, which deals with strategic items, that's a non decision making correct. meeting, mm -hmm. then a committee of council, which links some of the strategy and also decisions of committee, and that links with council meeting. It, it would mirror the agenda that's going into the council. council, so and that then, we are- So that's three meetings a month. We are talking about- And potentially about the fourth meeting is as required. Correct. I'm just saying which, 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 lose the fourth. Which we know that we use yep, all we do place, right. yeah. okay. Councillor Martin. Okay, I think I understand that. So what's being proposed is three meetings a month, and if there's a need for a fourth, will happen. Correct. No, 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 no. That's I'm not hearing that at all. That's so what I'm the board... hearing that there are four meetings. You must so, schedule them. So, Councillor Moran, let me let me get clarity. The Lord Mayor's made a suggestion. Board I need to be clear. Meeting. So, Lord Mayor, if you can just clarify, it's three meetings, and if there's a need for a fourth meeting, be it council committee or a strat workshop, that will be held. Correct. Correct. So that's what the Lord Mayor's suggesting, Councillor Martin. Correct. So, uh, uh, let me just say it back. Three meetings a month, Correct. one of which will be a council meeting. Correct. Uh, that's guaranteed, and Correct. then the possibility of a fourth. Correct. Well, look, I, I disagree profoundly with that. I, uh, I, I think it would be uh, shutting the council doors on democracy to close the place um, one week of the month. And on some occasions, where there are five Tuesdays in the month, council would seemingly not meet for two weeks. If this is a capital city, we are required to make important decisions and we make them every week. Indeed, there's a, a, an agenda full of them here uh, and some important, really important ones in the pink bits. Um, to be saying that these matters, and when it comes to organisations and individuals who are looking for answers for particular uh, problems that they have or proposals that they wish to, to make, it is unacceptable for a capital city to say, um, sorry, it will be another month before we meet. Lord Mayor, um, Councillor Moran and Councillor Sims, please allow Councillor Martin yeah. to finish. There's an opportunity for all of you to respond. So. Uh, it is a, an unacceptable outcome for our ratepayers for us to be meeting uh, on a reduced schedule. We are here to represent people on a weekly basis and that happens for all but two occasions of the year and the Christmas break. Um, that is, I think, uh, not a particularly onerous schedule. To be shutting this place down as frequently as is proposed is, I think, uh, unacceptable. Thank you, Councillor Martin. So I've got Councillor Hyde, Councillor Abraham today. I'll change my mind. Ten years, not enough. And then I'll go back to Councillor Moran and then the Lord Mayor and then Councillor Sims, and we're going to keep going today. But that's fine. This is an important discussion to have. And um, Councillor Hyde. Um, the comment was just made that capital cities meeting once a month for the actual council meeting is unacceptable, but it sounds to me like that's what other capital cities do. Is that, is that correct, Lord Mayor? That's what um, most other, other capital Lord cities Mayor, do? I checked in with um, Perth, Melbourne and Sydney. Lord Mayor, do you mind just saying Thank you. I uh, checked in with Perth, Melbourne and Sydney. They all have one council meeting a month. 
then they have their committee meetings. They've got slightly different committee structures and they schedule meetings as, as is needed. Interesting. So the city is most comparable to us. And so certainly their ambitions compared to ours as well meet once a month. So I think it's actually wrong for, for this workshop, the notes we were given to suggest that there isn't best practice that exists. I think best practice does exist. Um, and I think if we look at those cities who are slightly above us, which is Melbourne, Perth, um, certainly, oh, yeah. cert right. on 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 certain indicators, please, just on no. certain indicators, we can say if they're performing better than us, and this is what their structure is, that perhaps there is best practice. Now, this is an idea that's been floated. Uh, my experience being here um, uh, is that uh, my experience yeah. being here, councillors, can we please? I think had your councillor councillor Hyde. Councillors, you've had the opportunity to speak. You've got your opportunity to speak again. Please allow Councillor Hyde to finish, and there's no need to have personal attacks on people. <coughs> Councillor Hyde, please finish. Yes, certainly. Um, uh, so I reckon it seems that uh, a lot of the time we're meeting here, and every time we're meeting here, we're creating more work for administration who run around um, oh. frantically, oh. frantically, but in an unstrategic fashion. In an unstrategic oh. fashion. Oh. This oh. seems to be the issue. It's all good for people who have sat here for many years to talk Councilors. about tradition, to talk about tradition, but I'm here to make us work better. And if this proposal could make us work better, then I think that needs to be considered. And it could be only a trial. We could look at it for six months and see what happens. We could look at it for 12 months and see what happens. But I'd like to get some feedback from the CEO on this one as well, if I'm permitted the opportunity to ask any questions. Um, uh, at how many motions on notice do we have at the moment and what is the average council time Hyde, that it takes? I want the debate to be formed, this is the decision of council, I want the debate to be formed a little bit around the committee first for us to all have a bit of a discussion and then at the end I will open up the questions back to the administration if required. But for now let's just keep the discussion going so at least we can get a bit of a view. The administration needs to listen at the moment from us Certainly. and to get feedback from the elected body. Well my feedback is I like Sandy's idea. Okay, thank you. Councillor Brenton. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm just trying to um, uh, understand this. What what I think uh, the Lord Mayor is trying to get at is um, is to streamline things. So uh, um, from a from a new council member's uh, perspective, we've we've gone through a budget. We're going through a strategic uh, uh, plan. We're uh, going through some. Um, uh, uh, we're going we're going to make some big decisions on some big developments like. Um, Eddie O'Connell Streets, there is the uh, Central Market IK, there are lots of other projects happening. So uh, um, rather than having multiple people uh, at a session, be it, a, uh, you know, be it in a workshop, or I guess you know, the workshop and the committee are the same thing anyway, rather than having multiple people throw bits of information at you, you will, you will try to streamline it so that uh, you will group all the, uh, all the strategic things together, call that a workshop, no decisions being made. All we're doing is getting information from uh, from administration. We've got a committee, which is uh, a normal committee as we as we've got now, and then we've got a council meeting. So so really, all we're trying to do is we're trying to streamline things and um, and uh, package them up in manageable chunks, which uh, which I actually quite like. And this doesn't really have anything to do with. Uh, uh, with restricting democracy. I mean, if you want to talk about restricting democracy, look at what's happening in, in Hong Kong or, or the Middle East. Um, here, um, the residents, the businesses, all of our ratepayers still have the opportunity to grab us on the streets, to send us an email, give us a phone call, or come into the town hall and see us. So I don't see this as reducing democracy at all. Um, but I do like the idea of, uh, of streamlining things, and um, uh, especially for the, uh, for, for the new council members. There is a lot to take in, and so if we do have them in manageable chunks, I think uh, we'll all work uh, a lot more effectively. Councillor Donovan, sorry, did you have your hand up? I apologise. That's okay. Um, it was the Lord Mayor that put her hand back up, and then Councillor Moran, and then I'll go back to the Councillor Sims. Lord Mayor. Uh, I was actually going to just respond to. Um, uh, Councillor Martin saying that it was um, uh, basically not democratic to do less than that, and that the other, that the reason I asked the other uh, Lord Mayors is, is because I wanted to know how they were managing the big decisions and things that were going through um, through the other capital city councils. Um, um, so I mean, I'm happy to gather the the remaining capital cities, but um, the three that I spoke to, I thought we were the closest in terms of how. We do ours, and um, I know I was really interested in the Melbourne model, where they they call their 
uh, Committee Future Melbourne because it's all the decisions, strategic decisions going forward. Um, that fourth meeting, for instance, I would actually make sure it's still on our schedule, but it's actually how we use that fourth meeting. And we might find, particularly around budget time, that there's requirement for more than one council meeting, more than one strategic meeting, more than one committee meeting. But it's just a matter of, to me, if we streamline that, that that's actually a really good way for us to be working. Councillor Moran. Look, I don't really um, understand the word streamlining. It sounds a bit like the old joke that you got rid of the patients and the doctors, the hospitals would work really well. Um, streamlining, <laughs> streamlining to let, I mean, the best streamline in the world is just us to stay home and let, uh, let the CEO run the city. Very streamlined, no arguments, no nothing. He's the boss and, uh, you know, benevolent dictator is the best. But um, we have got a democratic system, and while I don't want to use too inflammatory language, uh, we have always met twice a month. Uh, it's worked very well. Um, it is not onerous. Um, and the decision making, I think what is onerous actually is the way the committees are structured, and that's what I thought we were talking about. Mm -hmm. I would have thought that two meetings were, and to actually suggest that Melbourne and Sydney are best practice is, is ludicrous. Um, uh, we are best practice. Why not be proud of what we do? Um, uh, well, we, we have to be proud. We have been, but we are certainly not best practice now. Um, but that's just the nature of the composition of council. Um, what the other councils are quite different. They do do their own planning. All the councils are on it, and they meet there. That's a decision making one. Also, some of their committees are decision making. So to say they have one meeting a month is uh, disingenuous. They meet uh, quite regularly on a decision-making basis. Um, I think 10 meetings a year is ridiculously, um, so I, I mean, it, it is a, a, the council to do it themselves. Administrations always want us to have 10 meetings a year because like the central market, once you don't have hands-on regular meetings uh, and get to know your colleagues, um, you lose interest. And I would say that none of the councillors here know the inner workings of the central market. Um, and I think if we had 10 decision-making meetings a year, uh, I'll, you, you know, I'll bow to you, Franz. Um, but uh, from a council perspective, though, um, you, don't, you just don't know. I don't know anymore either. Um, so I think I would ask that the Lord Mayor put in that fourth meeting as a committee stroke council meeting and so we're still potentially having two council meetings um, a month and I think that would get over it. But I just, streamlining when you, I mean why did you get on council if you just don't only want to meet once every month? I mean it's ridiculous. It's a hard job being on council. I prefer not to see some of the people here on a regular basis too and I'm sure they prefer not to see me but you signed up to be on council. Nobody works harder than Assam, nobody works harder than the Lord Mayor and I think the new members would be take a good leaf out of their book and come to the meetings and turn up. Mary, you've never been in a ward. Your ward, you don't, you're not working the ward. Councillor Moran. 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 Councillor Moran. 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 She me. Councillor Moran. Councillor Mary Kuros. Oh, so not that. Councillor Sims. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sorry, Thank you. Councillor Chair. Sims, there's a point of clarification. You can see Through you, Chair, just for the record, council is required to have a council meeting every month. So it'll be 12 minimum by the act that requires every month. So that's just one minute. So just to clarify, the 10 versus 12, it's 12. Councillor Sims. Thanks. And look, I um, I love seeing everybody um, every week. Um, I'd hate to miss um, seeing you all. Um, but look, for me, when people talk about streamlining, that often means steamrolling. Um, it means uh, providing um, less accountability um, for the uh, public. And uh, it means providing less opportunity for elected members to have input. Now, I can understand that, um, you know, sometimes it may be difficult for some members to absorb the information. Um, and I'm totally open to the idea of having um, a different committee structure that gives us time to talk through things in more detail. I think that's fine. But the idea that we uh, don't commit to having our meetings uh, twice a month, I think moves us in a very dangerous direction. 
it would give um, our administration more power over the agenda of the council because when we don't meet um, and aren't there setting the agenda for the administration, they are able to make decisions in, in our absence. And I think the community actually expects us to do the job we were elected to do, which is to provide guidance around the um, direction of um, the city. And the council is the conduit between the community and um, the administration, the elected body as well. So if we don't meet, um, then what mechanism does the community have to have input into our decisions? Councillor Hyde said we could give it a go as a trial. Um, it's an interesting suggestion. When I trial, trialed or suggested the idea of giving the community the opportunity to ask questions, that was how down we couldn't possibly trial that. Um, I think this is something that has the potential to be dangerous. Um, and to undermine our democracy at a local level. And so I don't think this is a direction we should go down. Just to clarify, CEO. Yeah, through Chair, just to be clear, um, regarding the administration making decisions rather than council, the administration can only make decisions in accordance with their delegated. Thank you, uh, CEO. Councillor Martin, you had your hand up? Yeah. I, no, no, no Councillor Martin and Councillor Connell. But oh. you signalled to him before you signalled to me. I'm no, sorry. no, no. I'll I saw you first, and I saw Councillor. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, look, I, um, I'm getting the feeling that this decision has already been made in the minds of the people sitting opposite me. Uh, and if that is the case, there is not much I can do as a, a minority in this council. But I would say to you, this is an enormous step. And if this is what's going to be voted on as a block, then you need to consider whether the example that has been given in other cities is actually like for like. Because the truth of the matter is that in other cities, committees have more broader decision-making powers than is the case in the city of Adelaide. And at a minimum, if you're proposing to surrender some uh, 50 meetings over the course of a council, then that is something that needs to be informed, not by the discussions that you've had in the back rooms, but by documentary evidence that the administration has Councillor Martin, to. just your comment that you just made, would you like to substantiate that with proof? Otherwise, you're just making allegations. So just be I'm mindful of what you're saying. Chair, I'm making an allegation. Well, please be mindful it, of the words It's a political use. allegation. Please this, be, this be mindful what? of the words you use in the chamber. Well, please. What, block value or meeting in back room? Uh, both. Okay. Um, so look, putting to one side the, the allegation that I just made, um, there is an important principle here, and it is not informed by anything more than the assertions of the, the councillors sitting opposite me and the Lord Mayor here, based on some anecdotal evidence. If I were making a decision this important, that is to say to the ratepayers of this city, whatever you thought when you elected us, we're going to meet half as often as you expected That's as a problem. council, as a council, we're going to meet half as often as you expect, then that ought to be informed by some advice from the administration. Um, I don't see that advice. All I'm hearing is the commitment that people in this room are already making to a proposal that's not informed by any independent advice. And I hear Councillor Kuros sighing, and I would expect her to sigh because she also agrees with this principle. Now, I say also well, that that there, no, I know, but a sign of the case. I don't know if Councillor Gross agrees with this principle. So just I the point of what has been called, Councillor, please limit your debate to your points <laughs> instead of pointing at other councillors. And I'd expect the same from the other councillors too. Please, let's be adults. Well, look, I'll, I'll uh, proceed with the point provided that others resist sighing or in other ways indicating that they disagree. Okay. The, the fundamental principle in all of this is that though the administration says it will only act according to the delegation of council, it will be required to act far more often than is the case now, where it refers matters to council. If council is meeting less often, there is less opportunity unless extraordinary meetings are called. And there is no appetite for extraordinary meetings in this place. Uh, my uh, experience in this place over the past year has been that on occasions, it's been difficult to establish a quorum for a meeting. So there is little prospect of that. But half the number of council meetings is what you're being asked to consider. 
I think you'll find that the right payers will object to that in the same way they did with the proposal to gag councillors before meetings in relation to motions. It is a proposal that will strike a chord with voters and it will be unwelcome. Thank you, councillor. Just to clarify, Senior, through you, Chair, just to clarify, regarding this, this process today, we are talking at a workshop. The workshop is providing comments to the administration. The next step here would be for the administration to prepare a report for the next committee and for that committee to discuss, to discuss and determine, and that would then be then forwarded on to the next council. So there would be informed discussion and there is a clear process. Just to be really clear. So to Councillor Martin's point, just quickly, Councillor, uh, in relation to the advice that the administration is going to provide, that will be provided as part of the report at the next committee. That's correct. I didn't hear that, but it, it's That's the CEO undertaking yes. to examine every other major city in Australia and provide a report to us on the nature of their meetings the voting authority of those meetings. No, councillor, just to be clear, the CEO, as he's made it clear in the beginning of the meeting, he's capturing advice from today. Based on the advice we have given the administration, he will form a report and he'll provide advice on that report legally of what council would like to do and move forward. He's not going to be providing any models from interstate. And further to that, Chair, if that information is inadequate, Council can resolve to direct me to find my further information. Well, uh, Chair, why can't we simply ask the administration to provide that advice to us rather than going through the process of reaching a decision based on what is the speculation and points of view of individuals? Why can't we have that advice provided to us? Well, again, to the point that the administration brought in earlier, this is a council decision. So it's a matter for us to decide how we conduct our meetings and how often we meet. That's why they haven't provided that advice today. If council wishes to do that, then my advice to you, Councillor Martin, is that the committee uh, at the next meeting request that in an amendment, and then if council agrees, that would happen. Just uh, uh, Councillor Sims, before you do, Councillor Canal, let's put his hand up first. Apologies, um, Interesting conversation. Um, I, I don't, well, what, what do I glean from this is that one, I do not expect us to be making any less decisions. But what I do think what we will be doing is that what I've noticed now over the, my, my period and certainly my apprenticeship here is that uh, we need to certainly go over a lot of material and certainly get, a, a, you know, as you go forward, a lot of understanding. So having opportunities where you can uh, discuss things in, in a way that you can uh, get more depth and understanding of whatever the issues are. That's really important. Sitting here in a, in a situation like this, we're not really discussing, we're actually, it's a debate and it certainly sides and all the rest of it. And for a lot of important decisions, and I thought that our last meeting last week was a great example of an attempt where we've tried to bring all the information forward and we've come to a point where we cannot, where we're paralyzed by trying to make a decision. Um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, we need to think about that is that, we, we have an orderly system, okay, workshops, which inform the, com uh, the committees, which then crystallise whatever the conversations are, whatever the issues are, you then bring them to the council, um, and you've had opportunities to develop the, the, uh, the your opinions and your positions, and also get much more information, because obviously, uh, uh, you know, when we don't do that, we either make poor decisions, or we, we, we can't make decisions, and then, uh, you know, we're not progressing at all. So I see the, um, whether you have two, uh, you know, de decision making per month or one, I mean, at the end of the day, you want to make them. You want to direct uh, the administration, who are, who, if you know, they they take our lead. We are the ones uh, uh, who are the employer, the, the bosses. Um, you know, they're not they don't work independently. If they do, obviously, they need to be held to, uh, they're held to account as well. The point is. You know, uh, you, they, we enact things. We have given, to, have had time to consider them, to uh, certainly be uh, informed about them. And I think it's a lot more important that we get understandings from our administration as we go forward and saying, okay, what is this? And we have then ability to then make good, clear decisions instead of, in many occasions, just debating and arguing and not necessarily having a really a great outcome for the city and also for the ratepayers. Thank you, Councillor Councillor. Uh, hope and then Councillor Sims. 
but you can't even remember my surname. I have been quiet for some for some time. <laughs> well, just to share some of my thoughts. Firstly, like I look at the screen and uh, about the key questions. What do you like about the current meeting structure? I can tell you, I like nothing about that. I think we have way too much meetings every month. Hence, I couldn't be efficient on each meeting. I believe in small government, not big government. Efficiency is more important than frequency. And uh, I, I think one council meeting per month is more than enough. We could have many other meetings to talk about other issues, but for the decision-making meeting, one meeting per month, I think is more than enough. Instead of getting the admin running around, providing elected members reports, I rather see the admin focus on those motions passed and deliver some result for our community. It's not about how many motions we pass here or how many motions we discuss here in this chamber. Especially some of those motions fail and got bring it back in in a month. This is not what we want. I want something that we could really focus. I'm sorry. Well, so it's Councillor. Uh, I, I want to see something that we, we Councillor seems uh, Councillor Ho, Councillor Martin. People sigh, people laugh. Please, let's just draw a line. I, now, Councillor I didn't Hogan. finish. I, 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 I didn't I know any of this. <laughs> anyway, look. And besides that, there's another thing that I like. To, I, I, I like to share uh, is about the gag order. To me, personally, have that many meetings are more like a gag order to me. Say on Friday afternoon, that is the time I receive the agenda for the next either committee meeting or council meeting. And then I will need to read all the reports from the admin as I got enough information. Afterwards, I will need to share those information and some of my thoughts with my community and listen to them and seek some feedbacks. Two days, three, one, two, three, four days are certainly not enough for me to get enough feedbacks from my community. Besides, that is a language barrier. I have to translate. I have to do the translations. So if, if I could have more time in between, then I think those motions that bring forward by other members, my community and myself will understand it better. Administration does not need to provide hundreds of the reports every year, but focus on some of the important issues and deliver results for our community. Last but not least, that's one thing I'd like to share just to other members. I don't live in Chinatown, I don't live in Central War, but none of you know Chinatown better than I do. It's not about whether or not you have a pillow in the area. It's about your heart and your connections in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Now, Councillor seems I've got the Lord Mayor again, I've got Councillor Hyde. So, members, let's not respond to each other. Let's provide points of clarification, otherwise this is not going to finish. Fair, fair point, uh, Chair. Because you've made your point clear, yeah, Councillor. No, no, and, and Councillor Ho's made a good point. This is about reducing the number of motions that come before Council. That's clearly the intention. Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. You have made your position clear. No, no, I just wanted to propose Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims, let me finish. You have made your position clear. If there's a change in your position, please state it so administration can hear it. If you're making a comment, I'm going to stop you because you've spoken already. It's not a comment. It's a suggestion in terms Please. of a way forward. Okay. Um, in terms of trying to reach a consensus, because I recognise administration have got to pull something from this, my um, suggestion would be that we commit, as was the previous resolution of council, that we retain the current council meeting structure, that is that we meet twice a month, as was agreed by resolution of council. And we did agree that we wouldn't discuss the frequency of meetings in this workshop. That was a resolution of council that's not been followed in terms of the way the workshop has played out. Well, However, just to get your I advice, propose, so you've, made, you've made a yeah, comment. No, let me finish. But Councillor Sims, you've made a statement that the CEO needs to clarify. Through you, Chair. Really, can I just ask you to clarify? Sean, through the Chair. Um, the resolution that Councillor Sims is referring to is not relating to the governance structure or the meeting schedule that's actually relating to a decision of council around uh, a review of the catering contract and the efficiencies that we could achieve around that where the request was for that review 
not to change the meeting structure. So the review of that didn't have to incorporate the meeting structure. That's unrelated to what we're discussing tonight, which is about moving forward. Um, so the existing meeting schedule will expire or will run out. We need a new meeting schedule. And that's what we're uh, debating today to get some feedback from yourself to then inform that. Well, okay, fair enough. I, I would suggest there is a, a bit of a contradiction. If we've agreed we weren't going to look at um, the uh, meeting structure, and we, we're now talking about that in terms of the frequency of meetings. However, as a way forward, I would suggest we commit to the continued structure of twice a month, and then that we look at the issues that the Lord Mayor has flagged in terms of the committee structure, and that is having one of the committees being an opportunity for a broader strategic discussions, um, which I think would be very useful. So that that's my um, compromise in terms of reaching consensus. So that's the same position you stated earlier, Councillor. Well, I just want to clarify that no, so there is a middle road. It's really road. important we don't waste the time, committee. So you've stated the same position you've already spoken about, and that's clear. So now we understand your position once again. Well, I'm just testing to see. Councillor Hyde, nothing's changed. Your, your position has been stated. It's very clear. Councillor Hyde, if you could also, if your positions change, if you'd like to add a point of clarification to the administration, please do so. I will not entertain further debate on this topic. You're right, we could debate until the cows come home. I would just like to add um, that I would, uh, when considering committee structure as well, I would also be open to us considering um, subcommittees. Um, there's a lot, often I go into the community and I explain to people that we have one committee meeting a fortnight and then one council meeting a fortnight. They say, oh, who's on the committee? They say, oh, it's the whole council. And I say, well, isn't that just stupid? Um, uh, often we're considering things once, uh, twice or three times. Um, uh, so I would also be in favour of us looking at subcommittees that deal with particular areas. Um, also, we know that we uh, are similar to in, in, in function and composition to a board. <coughs> on boards, there are various skill sets. I would also be open to us considering um, more use of working groups where we can leverage on the considerable skills. Not that those working groups would make decisions themselves or be decision-making bodies, they couldn't under the LGA, but that might allow for better uh, uh, better formed ideas to then come to either a committee or straight to council for consideration and then implementation as policy. I um, just want to flag that. Thank you, councillors. I've got the Lord Mayor um, to speak. I'll give her the floor to sum up on this issue since she's started it. Councillor, oh, no. sorry, Councillor Martin. I'm having the Lord Mayor to. No, I was going to get him to sum up. Are you summing up? No, I was going to ask, I was going to make a comment, ask the Lord Mayor to sum up, but if you'd like to speak, go ahead now. I was just going to suggest perhaps if uh, um, my colleagues would like to see 12 meetings a year, um, given the under use of the town hall, we could rent it out for functions, weddings, funerals. Come on, Councillor. <laughs> Councillor, Councillor, before Lord Mayor sums up, I might just briefly make a couple of comments and ask a question of administration. Um, uh, just from a structural perspective, um, there was a time at Council where we had uh, four committees uh, chaired by four different people that have four different functions that are responding to two council meetings or potentially sometimes one council meeting a month in my first term. Uh, Nevertheless, it's never been the case in my whole experience over the last two terms and now the third term of council where there hasn't been an enormous amount of special council meeting and special committee meetings called to deal with multiple issues. Um, so the flag, there's a bad base of 24 meetings a year or 18 meetings a year. If you look at historically, it's never been the case there's been a bad base. Uh, not to mention that there's ever an urgent item that needs to be dealt with. It takes the Lord Mayor and I believe two councillors or three councillors mm -hmm. to be able to call a special council meeting. So if there's an urgent community issue, if there's a problem that needs to be addressed, uh, there's a special council meeting that can be called at any time by the Lord Mayor or three councillors. So there's all those opportunities. I see there's an opportunity there to renew. And for me, the reason I see this is because this is attached to a significant amount of efficiency targets we work with the CEO on as well. Um, and I think there needs to be an alignment and touch points between us and the CEO. The delegated authority is clear on what the CEO can do and can't do. So even in the case where the CEO needs to make a decision and does not have a delegated authority to do so, he has the opportunity to request from the Lord Mayor to call a special council meeting or committee meeting and deal with those items. The things I like and the things I don't like, I'll state quickly. What I like about the Lord Mayor's suggestion is a strategic group or a strategic workshop where we can actually sit down without having to make a decision around the table with our administration. 
uh, and hear from the professionals and hear from the experts around some of the things that we're facing in the way of challenges to help us inform our decision making for committee and then for council. I think that's something that I'm really looking forward to, where we can have those style of discussions without uh, feeling the need that the decision needs to be made or to politicise an issue. I think that's a big plus. Um, the committee, for me, I'm still a bit confused about, to be honest, because uh, to some of the remarks that Councillor Hyde's made and some of the other councillors as well, to the community, it feels that we have four council meetings a month, not two, because the committee meetings, thanks to our lovely, transparent media outlets that are with us here today, they report very clearly that it's a committee decision. But our community does not understand the difference between a committee and a community decision. So in essence, the reality is when a committee makes a decision uh, and it's reported in the media as a committee decision, our public assumes that we've made a decision at that committee. And that's the reality of the situation. We need to accept that. That I find very frustrating. And we're talking about democracy. When people attend a council meeting, which is meant to be open, and that's where we make decisions, we move things on block. And that, for me, I also find a very transparent process. Until now, we've got cameras in committee. Before that, people couldn't see what was happening at committee. They rock up to council. The decision's already formed behind closed doors at a committee. <laughs> and then at a council, the decision's just voted on block. And that, for me, that connection between committee and council needs to be addressed. And that's something that, even with the new model, I'm not sure how we address. And that's the one thing that I'm unhappy about, because I'd like for the committee meetings to be one of two things either for the committee meeting to be a decision-making body where it makes a decision and that decision is final. Yeah. So that's one option. Or the committee meeting is a non-decision-making body where ideas are floated, discussed on the back of a strategic workshop and they're formed into a solid and that those are referred to council for a final decision. Uh, I think that's something that I'm hoping through the administrative report we have an opportunity to be able to formulate some type of a, an outcome relating to um, relating to how those two connect. Because for me at the moment, I feel there's a significant uh, public um, concern around what it perceives to be for council meetings or a matter of fact, it's two committee and two council meetings. Um, always open for trial. Um, I think in my experience in council over the last nine years now, um, I can tell you we've tried a heaps a whole heap of different models. Some have worked, some have failed miserably, um, and it's okay. I mean, this is what we're here to do. We're here to try new things to see the effectiveness of our decision making. But the most important part about the whole process is to make sure that councillors are well informed along the whole way, to make sure that when they reach council to make a decision, that that decision is well informed, well supported, transparent, and we've had the opportunity to hear from, uh, from the community uh, as well. Um, so look, I'm open to trying, and um, I just hope that through that report, um, the council administration is able to report on the legality of what will be recommended or suggested. Uh, to take into concerns um, the councillor Martin, councillor Sims, and councillor Moran's concerns, and any other councillors as well with regard to what can and can't work. Um, and most importantly for me, it's how do we uh, get that committee and council stuff to connect better. Um, and with that, I'll just hand over to the Lord Mayor to quickly, uh, briefly sum up on her points. I don't think there's much to sum up on, really. Um, uh, I, I looked at this and there was a question around what could the structure of these meetings be and how could that be improved? So I've put something forward for discussion. Um, it's been a very robust discussion, as it should be. Um, when I first started on council uh, in the administration, of course, uh, there was only one council meeting a month and there was a different committee structure. So um, the committee were, the committees were in a rotation, there were four committees, and um, but it went to one council meeting a month for the decision making. Um, and uh, it was um, absolutely fine and it worked. Um, what I'm actually trying to do with these is uh, separate actually things like today we've had two workshops, it's seven o'clock. Um, and what I'm trying to do is take these discussions, take these debates and take the big strategic matters so that we have the time to spend on them. And then uh, we have a committee that mirrors the agenda that's going into council so that we have clear advice from the administration and can ask questions as to what's going into council. Whether that committee is a decision making body or not, I'm not wedded to because I still believe that the decision should be made in the council chamber. Um, and so, um, and 
I would also um, ask if we could actually have a little bit within the report or whatever, just some information about how many additional meetings we've called, how many special council meetings we've called, um, because I do believe that we should schedule that fourth meeting and use it as we need it. Um, and we know how many additional meetings we've had. Even this year, there's been Correct. many, many additional meetings, and I think that we could well, well use that time. Thank you very much. It's been a robust discussion, as the uh, Lord Mayor has said, and we look forward to the administration to uh, present a report to the next meeting. Thank you, members. Uh, we'll move on to the next item, 5.2. Uh, members, I... Um, sorry, I apologise. Correct. Uh, Councillor, thank you, Councillor Martin. So, recommendations of review of council event <coughs> mitigation standard operating procedures. Councillor Martin, hand it over to you. We have a... Uh, we have a committee rec we have a recommendation from administration. As printed. As printed. Can I have a second, please? Seconded by Councillor Sim. Would you like to speak to you? Reserve my right. Councillor Sim. Reserve my right. Any discussion with regards to this item? Should be here, Julian. Councillor Martin, to sum up? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. If you're only new. <laughs> <laughs> Item 5.2. Um, now, this item here, um, councillors, I'm going to hand over to Councillor Moran quickly. Uh, Councillor Moran, um, I believe you want to move the deferral? Uh, look, yes, um, yes, Chair. Can I have the um, motion first? So just to be can I, deferred. Can I explain? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I just want to get a mover and a seconder. So All right, move. Seconded by Councillor Sims. Go ahead. Uh, the reason I want this deferred is I moved this uh, 12 months ago. Um, the Lord Mayor and I announced it with a great flourish. So just a point of order, sorry, uh, I apologise, Councillor Moran, for interrupting you. Uh, the matter to be deferred to when? Uh, indeterminate. To the future? Um, just the future. to the future. To a future meeting. Uh, to a future meeting, yeah. that's fine. Thank uh, you, Councillor, go ahead. It's, a, it's been a bit of a passion of uh, Sandy and mine for quite some time, and when Sandy became Lord Mayor, I thought it was an opportune moment to uh, bring this up again, and it may have its time. We announced it with a great flourish, and the media were very good. Um, it has slightly shocked me that a four-page report has taken 12 months in the making. Um, I have, I expected <coughs> a lot more meat on that bone. Um, but uh, that, that aside, it is an interesting report. Um, but I thought, that I would be um, like included, and so would the Lord Mayor, in putting that forward. Now I've got information from Perth and and Sydney and Melbourne on all their planning laws, and I haven't been spoken to by the administration at all. And I said when I moved the motion almost 12 months ago that I wanted to be not not to to direct what the report said, but I was a font of information. And I feel untapped. Um, so, <laughs> so to speak. Sing of so many songs, by the way. So many songs. So, like, <laughs> <laughs> so there's, no, there's nothing. I really want this to happen, as does Sandy. And I can't I'm, get that vision out of my mind. <laughs> um, we really want, we, and I think I can speak to Sandy, really want this to be a game changer. Now that report isn't a game changer. Um, it doesn't explain why. There are many multiple vacancies in the city childcare. Um, but I know why. Um, Sandy knows why, and it doesn't say that. If I read that report, I'd, I'd probably just leave it. Uh, so I urge you to support the deferral so that um, the Lord Mayor and I, and anybody interested or knowledgeable about the, in that area, could speak to the, uh, feed the information, not to pervert the course of, uh, of to, to, to change what the report says in its recommendation, but I've got information and it's not there. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Anyone would like to speak against this? I have a question. Um, Councillor Hyde, can you take it offline? No. Go ahead. Um, my, my question is just in interpreting the report before we vote to defer it. Um, it seems that the, the biggest issue around in this area is the um, uh, the, the BCA or the NCC, whatever you want to call it, National Construction Code, which does not outline 
um, standards for putting childcare centres in multi-level buildings. Is that correct? Which is why I asked. Yes. It's just a point of clarification. Before I defer, I, I want to understand what I'm deferring. Through the chair, shall take you to. Um, through the Chair, thank you Councillor Hyde for the question. Um, there are a number of issues, uh, the National Construction Code is one of them. Um, the other issue is there are some very stringent standards that, that childcare, which is a nationally administered uh, body, uh, require in terms of space, open space and the like for childcare centres. Councillor, any other questions? Um, well, just one. So noting noting that the Metropolitan Fire Service has suggested that there is an adequate safeguards in the code for putting children in childcare centres in multi-level buildings. Do we have any childcare centres in multi-level buildings in the city? Because I would be concerned that they would be unsafe from fire risk, given the deficiencies of the code. Uh, once again, um, uh, Mr. Mr Chairman, this is debating the report Councillor, just ask the question. So I'm just. But it's debating what's in the report. I'm talking about the referral. Councillor, I understand. He's just clarifying the point. If there's a, a risk currently pending, I guess it's important that we hear it. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, the answer is no. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other remarks with regards to the deferral? Councillor Moran, to sum up. Sum up. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried to be deferred. Move on to item 5.3, the Adelaide Parklands Expenditure and Income Report. We have a recommendation to receive the report. Moved by Councillor Sims, seconded by Councillor Martin. Councillor Sims. Is that my right? Councillor Martin. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, questions, if I may, Deputy Lord Mayor. And I think Mr. Cook is aware of a, an issue that a ratepayer of mine raised. And that is around the confusion of the number of hectares. The previous reports, and I quote um, June 2018 to APLA, that there were 723.5 hectares. A previous report that said there were almost 750. And in this one, we're saying 690. It's uh, the number of parklands um, uh, hectares seems to be shrinking. Um, could you please provide an explanation? Uh, through the chair, it, it, the um, investigation into what constitutes parklands and what doesn't is, is an ongoing piece of work, and we're trying to refine it as we go along. So things do change as our understanding changes, and also um, some areas of the parklands change as well physically. And um, so the report that we presented last year talked about what was green and accessible public parklands. The figures we're quoting tonight is more about what council manages, what portion of that land council manages. So there is a difference, but it's um, yeah, it's a work in progress. And included in that is the riverbank area? Uh, yes. Thank you. Anything that council controls in the riverbank area. Um, well, that's answered my questions. I, I did want to make a couple of quick comments if I had the opportunity. Go ahead, Councillor, if you like. Well, no, if others want to ask questions, I'm happy no, to. No, we've, we've moved the motion. We're informal, so you can speak. Okay. Um, look, I, I uh, uh, thank uh, Mr. Cook for this. This is um, a really detailed report, and it contains a great deal of uh, information that I didn't understand before, and being able to put it all together and see the costs isolated uh, to the parklands is really useful. But um, I am um, trying to understand why it is that the golf course um, is in there <coughs> as a uh, uh, an area in which we record spending and income, but we don't do that for the aquatic centre. Is there a reason for that? We try to focus the report on what is green, um, publicly accessible, normally publicly accessible parkland. So what is um, to all intents and purposes parkland? So the aquatic centre we uh, well, some of us consider is there's a facility within the parklands. It's not a green open space, but we manage uh, the same as we do lots of other areas of the parklands. Okay. Well look I, I understand that explanation. However, if you're calculating income and expenses related to activities in the parklands, 
um, then I would have thought the aquatic centre should be in there. Um, I note also that the, um, uh, the, the tables disclose some really valuable information. Page 39 and page 40, when read together, show that council's expenditure for parkland expense at table three is 541,000 and our income at page 40 is 500,000. That is, uh, for the first time in three years, we're actually uh, getting less in than we spend on sporting events. That's quite separate to the uh, sponsorship and other details that we've talked about. Uh, similarly, uh, council's uh, expenditure and income from the uh, golf course and the U parks are out of whack. Accumulated losses in the past three years appear to be $1.1 million. Uh, and the, the same with Parklands Properties. Uh, we're losing this financial year the same or more on our total property, spending 1.6 million and getting back 950,000. Now, uh, if that's correct, that's uh, much worse than the Aquatic Centre, but they're the, the figures and um, they are quite revealing in that sense. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Hyde. Um, I was going to ask a couple of questions, but uh, a little bit has been clarified. I'd like to make some comments if you want to start. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you for the work. Uh, I think it's, it's very, um, it, it's a good start. It's a good start. It's comprehensive enough, but um, I'm conscious of how many uh, departments the parkland management runs across um, uh, and what have you. I think it's interesting that it um, seems that year on year we spend about 25 odd million dollars on the parklands. Um, uh, and that's about 25% of the rates we collect each year. So um, the council rates we collect, 25% poof, um, uh, goes there on the parkland. So I think that's important for us to, to look at it. And that's very much why I brought this motion in and I'm glad that Council Mark is enlightened by it. Certainly I'm enlightened by it. Because um, uh, I think this is an issue that we need to look at. Um, uh, going forward, I, I won't suggest it here, but I, I do think we need to look at this in more depth. Um, perhaps in workshop structure, I'll flag that now with uh, the CEO and others, um, uh, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, but there's only one employee in the entire city of Adelaide that deals solely with parklands, and that's yourself, more or less? Uh, no. But there's no parklands department? No, not a single entity. No, no, that's right. And I think when it comes to management of this $25 million, everyone's got a piece of the pie, Everyone, everyone's got a finger in the pie, and that means there's limited visibility over the parklands as a whole and how we're operating in that space. Um, so I do think we need to do more work to understand exactly what's going on here. Certainly talking to staff in ad hoc conversations with with staff, they don't know what happens in other parts of the parklands and so, because it's not in their portfolio. And so how best are they meant to suggest innovative solutions to problems and, and uh, to see where we can uh, operate more efficiently um, with 25% of the rates that we collect going on to the parklands um, instantly. So uh, with that, I thank the administration for the immense uh, amount of work and I'm sure it was very difficult to pull together. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillors, any other remarks? I'll just seek a quick point of clarification if that's okay. So just to be clear, um, the parklands expenditure is 33.1 uh, million for the financial year. However, with grants, we ended up at 25.6 million in expenditure. And then on the back of that, we collect $6.2 million in revenue. So which nets our position at about the $19 million mark, I'm guessing in expenditure, is that correct? Yeah. So this takes into account from an income perspective, um, all the parkland leasing for events, all of that goes into that budget of income as well? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, look, it's, um, it's very, very interesting that the ratepayers of the City of Adelaide have been left to, uh, to fork out the bill. 25,000 ratepayers in the City of Adelaide, 20 million, 20% 20 of their rates are coming from this for a piece of land, a very important piece of land that is important for all South Australians. So in essence, after revenue, I'm just talking about if we collect revenue, we're still sitting at 19 million. So we need to sort of almost think that we have an opportunity if we do one thing in this council where we protect the parklands and able to convince the state government that this is a, a jewel for all South Australians and pick up 50% at least of that, we have an opportunity to reduce rates in the city by 10% across everyone, which is a significant reduction. I think it's very unfair that the city of Adelaide ratepayers continue to uh, subsidise the, uh, the parklands on their own uh, at the tune of 20% 
uh, of, of their rights. I really do. I think it's uh, it's something that has been lumped onto us along the years that we've had to manage, and it's something that we need to uh, continue consulting and working on. But uh, I'd like to see that figure being reduced, uh, but not at the expense of, of losing control over parklands either. So there's got to be uh, some type of a, a mediation <laughs> and a middle ground that we can manage. But I'll hand over back to Councillor Sims to sum up. I think Councillor Sims, you move the motion, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And look, yes, thank you, um, Martin and the team. It is a, um, an important piece of work. Happy to look at the question of getting others to contribute, but the fundamental point is that it not be at um, the expense of council having control over the parklands. You know, the old saying, he who pays the piper pays the tune. Um, and uh, the golden rule, he who has the gold makes the rules. We don't want to uh, give up our control over this uh, public space. Um, yes, it's a significant investment, but it is fundamental to uh, preserving our city's reputation as a unique uh, world-class city in a park. So um, I make that point. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is received. We move on to item. Um, you just one second. I'm dealing with the item. I've seen Councillor Hyde. I've seen you. You've got. You've got. You want to move the motion, or what are you want to do? You both got a variation. So okay. Fun. So councillors, five point three um, Adelaide Parklands. Sorry, five point four Adelaide Zero Project. So Councillor Hyde, um, you've got a variation. And Councillor Sims, you have a variation. It's been sent to the Yes. So I'll do with yours first. And then I'll take Councillor Sims. Yeah, mine's been circulated. Okay. So does it does your does the um, administration have yours? They as well? do, and you do. I sent it to everybody. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um, yes. Uh, do we want me to read it out? Or um, is it happy to take it as read if the council is. So, councillors, we have a, a recommendation or an amendment from Councillor um, Hype on the board. I'll give you a minute to read it just in case you haven't, and then I'll seek a seconder. Yeah, I've been seconded. Seconded by Councillor uh, Abraham Zeta. Councillor Hyde, you've got the floor. Um, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, this uh, variation doesn't alter the original intent, which is to fund the um, inner city services hub, which is the critical component of the IGH report, and that um, I fully intended to have funded when I moved for the original $300,000 um, in this year's budget to be allocated towards this project. What this does at uh, number three and number four um, uh, is that it addresses an issue that we know is an emerging um, issue and we've been caught a little bit off guard um, uh, in the city um, uh, around uh, problems with Aboriginal mobility. Now there's work that's been currently underway for a number of years actually um, uh, with, uh, to deal with this, to deal um, uh, with drinking in the parklands and, and uh, transient population use of the parklands and ensuring that these people are, are kept safe and have uh, uh, services and I think at the end of it all a facility um, where uh, people can transition to. Um, uh, we know that we have problems where uh, sometimes people come from country to, to Adelaide um, and then they're not able to get home. Um, uh, this, this money um, basically will work uh, within the framework that we've set up with AZP um, uh, to, uh, to fast track uh, a solution to Aboriginal uh, mobility, uh, not just within the parklands, but within the city of Adelaide broadly. Um, uh, the, there was unfortunately, it seems, some reluctance um, of political leadership uh, in the previous state government um, and to a lesser degree, I guess, the previous council in dealing with this issue. Um, uh, but I think uh, now that we have the Adelaide Zero Project established, um, uh, now that we have social service providers and the private sectors or private sort of sectors uh, buying into, into trying to fix the problem, it's now time for council to take some leadership. Um, uh, given, given the issues that we have um, had at play more recently, which is ahead of the seasonal sort of issues that we have, um, uh, take leadership on this issue, put this money to the side um, uh, and suggest that AZP work to use this to address the problems directly. Um, I think that's what our residents want. We know that, we know that they've been having meetings um, uh, and involving us uh, to a degree. Um, uh, we know the police uh, need assistance um, in helping solve this issue. We know that we can't police our way out of this problem. Um, we need a comprehensive policy uh, solution to it. Um, and this money, I think, will go a long way to addressing that solution. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Ramsey, you seconded the motion? Uh, reserve my right, Chair. So I have a, um, does anyone speak to the motion before I take a variation potentially from Councillor Sims? 
So, Councillor Sims, you have the floor. Thanks, uh, Chair. I wish to move an amendment. Um, that is that uh, one remain as printed, and yep. um, that the two and three be released, uh, be replaced with just 1.2, releases the remainder of the $200,000 to the Adelaide Zero project to go towards implementing the recommendations of the IGH report. So seconded by Councillor Moran. Councillor Sims to speak to the motion. Thank you. Um, thanks, Chair. Look, um, the reason I, I'm putting this forward is I, I think um, it's important to note that this is bigger than just uh, a problem impacting on Aboriginal people. Um, it's a, a really broad issue, a complex issue within um, our city, and it shouldn't be framed just as a, um, an Aboriginal issue, certainly not as a, um, a law and order issue or... Um, <laughs> Speaking of antisocial behaviour, <laughs> no, it, sh it shouldn't be framed um, just as a, a as, as an issue uh, like that. We need to have um, a broader, um, a much um, broader um, focus. Um, I proposed initially when this recommendation first came to council that we um, release the full uh, two hundred thousand dollars to the Adelaide Zero project. Um, and my rationale for doing that was because um, I thought they should get the money and assistance from council to help them uh, meet their recommendations. It may well be that the um, Aboriginal mobility uh, work is looked at as part of that, and I'm certainly um, supportive of that if it's part of a broader approach. Um, but I think we should give the uh, Zero project the opportunity to um, uh, look at that and to uh, determine Determine how they would like to spend all of the, um, all of the money remaining. Uh, Councillor Donovan and I um, went to a, um, a residence meeting uh, while Councillor Hyde was on holidays, I think, um, and uh, we got some really good feedback um, from the local community um, about their concerns. But there was recognition that this is a, a big, complex issue in our city, um, and there are no easy solutions. Um, we can't be seen to be targeting any particular group. Um, we need to have a holistic approach. And I think asking the Adelaide Zero project to um, look at the broad suite of recommendations um, makes sense. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Councillor Murray. Yes, Ed, Mara. We, any other remarks? Councillor Hyde. I'm oh, sorry, Lord, no, I didn't see you. She first speak. No, go ahead. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Sims for his interest um, uh, in this topic. Certainly, when I originally secured this $200,000 in the last budget, the intent was that it would all be spent this financial year, and I think we will be well on track um, to achieve that. Um, uh, what I do understand uh, is one of the concerns and the reason this report has come towards us is because <laughs> there were some things that we didn't think the state government contributed enough money on. That was the original intent, um, was that we wouldn't be footing the whole bill for components of the report. Now, I still want all this money to be spent um, within this financial year, but I do think just releasing all of it um, uh, uh, leaves us open um, uh, to not getting as much out of the state government as we can. Uh, we, what we should be doing with the uh, almost $100,000 that is left, if my original motion is successful, um, uh, is going and saying, uh, uh, okay, we pick X, Y, and Z projects out of the, out of the, out of the IGA Report, and we expect you to fund them 50-50, and if so, we can get this happening. I think that from a bargaining position is much stronger and allows us to actually achieve more recommendations of the report than if we just um, uh, release all $200,000 now. Um, uh, just just um, touching on it as well, um, uh, yes, I'm aware of the community meetings that were held while, while I was away. Um, uh, that's why the first thing I did when I got back is I went and spoke to um, uh, all of those people, and in the last almost a week since I've been back. Um, uh, I've engaged with them, I've engaged with SAPOL, I've engaged with Anglicare, um, I've engaged with other social service providers, um, I've engaged with the community, other councillors, representatives from Adelaide Zero Project um, and our own administration. Um, I've worked my original motion through thoroughly um, and I think that is the best way to address this going forward in the longer term than just sort of a let's throw it all into the breeze um, uh, type approach, which is why I would speak against this motion. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Uh, Councillor, uh, sorry, the Lord Mayor and then Councillor Martin. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, members, um, just I know that you know that I'm on the um, Adelaide Zero Project Advisory uh, alongside as a co-chair with Minister Lindsay and there was a meeting today. Um, 
uh, and I did actually discuss with some of the members um, the allocations and what the intention was, which was, I think it was 1.2 million of state funding that was required in 200 of uh, the City Council. Um, where I do actually um, uh, commend Councillor Sims for wanting the remaining money to go to the Adelaide Zero project, I do also know that there are some recommendations going forward for state budget funding. Um, where we could actually match funding to deliver much more. Um, and so, for instance, the 45, where both parties have contributed for the feasibility study, uh, was um, was really welcomed and that would give us a great outcome for uh, looking at feasibility for the Inner Services Hub. Um, uh, so I won't support this council sense, even though I totally agree that it is absolutely our intention to um, allocate that money within this financial year, and also that, uh, but it's also an intention to deliver on some of the other recommendations out of the IGH um, uh, report. Um, so, and given there's so much work going at the moment, I do believe that there are some other opportunities for us to partner um, early in the new year that may deliver a bit more than we, we currently have on the schedule. On the Thank agenda. you, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, um, the issue that I have with this is that if this doesn't succeed, then the previous amendment will go, get up. There's not a doubt in my mind about that. And the problem I have with that is that in this circumstance, the Lord Mayor speaks about where there are all kinds of opportunities coming up in an absence of any advice from the administration that one particular program is better than another. This is uh, an amendment on the fly for a, a particular a particular use, not this one. This one is the, the difference with this is this is giving the people who are responsible for the project the capacity and the authority to determine the priority. The other motion simply says, here is a problem with Aboriginal drinking in the South Parklands, and here is the money to deal with it. When in fact, we don't know whether it, that, that is the Zero Project's preference. Moreover, we know from the confidential part of the papers tonight, that this matter is already well in hand. It's been in hand since 2018-19. Um, well, it's in hand. I'm not saying how, I'm just saying to you, it is in hand. And this, therefore, represents a duplication, as far as I can tell. And uh, in, in the circumstances, um, a, a, a misspend of the money, uh, a, a calculation that this is what's required for a very particular problem, and a problem that I think is misjudged, to suggest that it is Aboriginal drinking when in fact it is a much broader issue. And indeed the Adelaide Zero Project have made it very clear that uh, the issue of rough sleeping and alcoholism may intersect, but they are not intrinsically linked. They are linked to a whole range of other causes. And those causes include things like domestic violence. They include things like uh, New Start allowance being inadequate to allow people the proper housing that they deserve. It, it includes also issues as simple as mental illness. To suddenly direct the Dunstan Foundation to take $60,000 and direct it to one particular aspect of a, an enormously complicated problem is an oversimplification and in my view, a misjudgment of the way in which this should be handled. Instead of councillors, who missed the meetings with the community, who missed the meetings with the police. Well, Lord Mayor, you can sigh too, but that is the circumstance. There was a deal of information given to us, those who were prepared to attend the meetings, those who received the information, and it left us in no doubt that there were a variety of responses that might be possible that are dependent on a whole series of decisions to be taken, particularly within government. Now, this is a better outcome. It gives the people who know what they're doing the opportunity to allocate their priorities. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Don. Thank you, Chair. I agree completely with the urgency in which 
previous councillors have spoken about the need to address some of the issues that have arisen and at the community consultations that I've attended that has come through loud and clear and repeatedly and there are a lot of community members who are really suffering individually, their families, their safety, so I absolutely agree with the urgency. What was clear from the consultation, both the community consultations on the ground and hearing everyone's individual perspectives, as well as talking to Senior Constable Matt Nan and all of the other service providers were there, that were there, is this is well beyond any one subgroup. And there are some dominant features that are getting targeted and that are certainly present, but this is a complex issue that requires that depth of response. And there are a number of different um, groups that are participating in some of the behaviour <coughs> causing problems in uh, areas including Whitmore Square and New Garden. So I completely agree with the idea of allocating additional funds because of the urgency of this issue that has arisen more recently. I don't agree with allocating it toward a specific target. Therefore, I would be supporting of the alternate motion put forward by Councillor Sims. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor, sorry, Councillor Moran, I apologise. Yes, look, I agree with what the previous speakers have said. To, um, to sheet all the problems in the South Parklands down to the Indigenous community is both offensive and incorrect. Um, uh, I do, I did pause to think about what the Lord Mayor said, that we need to keep some money in our pit pocket. We are not short of money. Um, I say that we spend this money now and if we need to match some funding in the future, uh, we, we can scrimp and find it because this um, problem is just so important. Um, I don't really understand the term um, Aboriginal mobility. Um, I gather that is the term for sleeping raft alcoholism, all the associated problems there. But I'm not an expert and there's not anybody really at this table who is an expert, even though somebody thinks he is on practically everything. Uh, we are not experts. The Zero Project are the experts and that they should be given the money that we've got at hand now to allocate to what they wish. The only, I mean, clearly this motion has zero chance of getting up um, and Councillor Hyde's will, but it is a mistake to pick out one. We don't know, we are, as I said, we are not the experts. Neither are the residents. We, the, the Aboriginal community are very visible in the parklands and um, I know too from visiting friends and people in the southern ward that there is a lot of chatter about that but if you go and speak to the agencies for instance the um, the grove of trees in front of the old um, Etsa building that's now called something else glamorous uh, apartments mm -hmm. there is a, um, a completely non-indigenous camping population in there and they have been for some years so it's an easy win to say i'm getting you know i'm going to help the aboriginal i'm going to crack down on the aboriginal drinks in the parklands it's a popular thing to do but it is it is not the right thing to do we should hand the money to the experts and let them work out what is the priority for what is a real problem um, but this uh, this is the right motion. The other one is um, is very wrong for you. Thank you, Councillor Sims. To sum up, if there's no other councillors to speak, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Madam Chair. Look, my my reason, as I uh, indicated in introducing this uh, amendment, was that I really want to make it clear that this requires a much broader um, response. And my concern about uh, singling out one particular aspect of the recommendations is that that could create the misconception that this is um, an issue that impacts or is about one particular segment of our community, in particular the Aboriginal community. And, you know, I noted um, Councillor Hyde's comments in the media today, and I'm not having a go at you, Councillor Hyde, um, but, you know, through you, Chair, some of the uh, comments, I think, have the potential to inflame what is a difficult situation. Um, and that I'm not saying that was your intention, but I think that could well be the consequence of the way the issue has been framed. And I worry that if we, uh, as our approach, simply allocating an amount of funds to deal with one aspect of 
um, what is a very big and significant problem, um, that could send the, the wrong message. So that's why I'm uh, moving this um, amendment tonight, because um, I think it's important that we address the broad issues. And as Councillor Moran um, and Councillor Martin and Councillor Donovan have said, that the group that um, the best place to make that judgment around what are the recommendations that they consider to be really prescient are, uh, I think, the uh, zero homelessness group. They've gone through that process, their best place to determine um, where the, uh, the money should go. Um, and um, that's all that I'm asking of. To the Lord Mayor's point about, you know, it makes sense to keep some money in the kitty um, as a bit of a bargaining chip. We are coming towards the end of the financial year. Um, and and um, so I think if we haven't spent it, um, you know, in the next little while, we're going to run out of the opportunity to do so. And of course, we can then um, look at bids in the next um, budget cycle to match funding commitments if, if need be. So um, I'd encourage you to support this motion. Councillors, I put this to the vote. We're talking about the variation currently on the screen by Councillor Sims. All those in favour? All those against? Well, that fails. We'll go back to the previous motion put by Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde, anyone else would like to speak to this uh, motion or recommendation, sorry, amendment? Councillor, sorry, is a seconder, Councillor Abrams, is this right? You seconded the motion? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I just want to point out what Councillor Hyde uh, mentioned earlier, that um, what needs to happen here is a comprehensive body of work, but also uh, homelessness, as, 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 as we all know, and, and as we all, we've all uh, talked about homelessness, um, I remember um, the last council elections, almost every single one of us here, if not all of us here, had something mentioned in our, uh, uh, in our uh, um, pamphlets um, about homelessness because it's not a it's not an easy issue to to solve it's not something that um, that the council should uh, should tackle on its own it's not something that the state government can tackle by, by itself either it's a multi-agency approach and this ensures that all the relevant stakeholders actually come together and work together in order to reach a solution rather than throw money around and, uh, and expect the solution to be fixed um, and expect the problem to be fixed Councillors, uh, sorry, Councillor Martin. I think the Lord Mayor had a hand up first. No, go ahead, Councillor. <laughs> um, look, I am going to ask just for once that the team, someone in the team breaks out of their numbers and votes wow. against this. That would be really good to see. So talk among yourselves about who would like to do that. But the point, the point that Councillor... Councillor, I, I, I don't know when we're going to stop this childish behaviour. Um, very no, 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 Councillor, it's trading chair. Well, similar with you, Councillor, no, it's been the same thing all along. Yeah. So just please, 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 please. Councillor Kuros, I'm speaking. I'm sorry. Can we please stop the attacks? Look, uh, please. Deputy Lord Mayor, please. Please. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy Councillor happy. Kuros, I've got the floor. No, you respond through the chair. I'm speaking. Can we please stop the attacks on each other? We are on watch by our ratepayers. Can we please just present to our ratepayers in a mature, conversational way where can debate can occur without people feeling that they can't leave, can't wait to leave the room? Please, no attacks. Let's talk to the facts. Councillor Martin, please speak. Deputy Lord Mayor, I am happy for someone to investigate what I'm suggesting. I'm happy for the administration to investigate it. I'm happy for someone outside to investigate it. I'm saying that I'm sick of it as well. But let me address the points that Councillor Abrahamsen was making. There. That's great. That's how we should debate. Address the points. What's the point? They all work together. Address yeah. the points. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. There's, uh, no point. No. Councillor Martin, address. No, no, there's no no. So, so to clarify, you've taken three minutes out of this council meeting to, uh, to to fight the man, where you've got an opportunity to actually debate the point. Please debate your point. There's, there's no point. The outcome is determined. In your point of view, I believe. Uh, okay, I bet you're Lord Mayor, Councillor Moran, no one's speaking to you. You don't have to respond. Lord Mayor. Uh, I was going to ask two questions, and one is um, the allocation doesn't say who the allocation is to. Um, if we could actually clarify who the allocation is to. And the other question was to administration to see if there's been any discussions as to how that allocation of funding might help the situation at the moment. 
Are you requesting clarification? I'm, I'm happy to clarify. Yes. Uh, as my mover, what's your intention, Councillor? Um, yeah, given, given the reference to Adelaide Zero Project, uh, the, uh, the idea is that the $60,000 will go to addressing the work that is currently being undertaken by AZP, particularly under them is Anglicare, who are looking at transitional accommodation and other solutions. So the money is to go to the Adelaide Zero Project? To the Don Dunstan Foundation? Uh, yes, but to look at the existing work that they're doing, because I know that's far progressive. So, um, does this require, from an administrative perspective, do you need to see the allocated 60000 going to Adelaide Zero Project, or do you see the intent in that clear? So, it does actually change it, it does, um, yeah. because that allocation is going to the Adelaide Zero Project, but specifically to address a problem at the moment, and that they will allocate it to who is, who is going to do that work, um, Anglicare, I would imagine. Yeah. So can we actually make that change to the, are you happy to take a variation to? So, uh, Lord Mayor, just to be clear, are you requesting that in point four, allocates the 60,000 to the Adelaide Zero project? Correct. Is that what you're requesting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's a I've read it as the same intent, I guess. No, I didn't. Um, do you just uh, the most important thing that administration gets it right. Um, admin, um, if I could get a response to the CEO, do you see that the change makes it clearer or were you clear on the initial intent? That's my understanding of what that's for. Um, through the chair, my, my understanding was uh, due to um, recommendation number three. So it's noting an existing project that's already underway yep. through Adelaide Zero project. Um, my assumption was that 60K would go to AZP to continue the work that's okay. already underway. So However, that edit now just makes that very clear. Provides it more, so this provides more clarity. Just one second, please, uh, councillors. I can see your hand, Councillor Martin. You forfeited your right to speak, though. Um, Lord Mayor, um, the um, is this provided for your intent? Uh, thank you, it does. Yes, so, thank okay. you. I, I mean, I did understand it to mean that, but I wanted it to be part of the motion so that I was very clear that it was going to the Adelaide Zero Project and that they would allocate that funding to the work that's being done. So, that's I need a show of hands on this from councillors just to say, please, to, to change. Thank you very much. The second is happy with this as well. Okay, so I've Councillor Sims and then Councillor Martin. Thanks. I just wanted to um, ask a few questions of administration. I'm just keen to understand um, the, uh, the term that's being used here um, around. Um, sorry, I didn't bring my glasses in today. Uh, ab Aboriginal mobility and transient uh, population use of the Adelaide parklands. Can I just ask exactly what's meant by that term, um, and also? how this has come about in terms of uh, has or, or might be a question for you councillor hyde is this something that's been raised with you specifically by the the zero uh, the zero homelessness group what how is that um, been identified as a particular target so i'm just wanting to understand those so there's two questions uh, the definition of aboriginal mobility and transient population in the parklands and there's another question that relates to how did this come about so for the how this came about i'll go to councillor hyde because he's he's the mover yeah he's the mover of the motion so if you could just respond to the question yes yeah, certainly um uh for clarification i suppose i was always going to bring um something in this policy space however the um, uh, the movement of people from anecdotally I understand the Northern Territory quite early, and these are people that we've never seen before coming down to the parklands, um, has precipitated um, this response. And so this is uh, sort of a pivot of the existing work that we're doing, make it quicker, um, uh, seeing that we're nimble enough to respond to this through the work that's already been done. So there's already stuff on the way, fast track it, get it there sooner because of the problems that we're seeing that have been reported on and that there have been community meetings about. Councillor Hyde, you haven't responded to the question though. How did this, did you consult with the Adelaide Zero Project? That's the question that Councillor oh, yes. Sims have asked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, the first conversation I had about Aboriginal mobility was, I mean, I'd have to check my diary, but I think I met with Anglicare months, months ago. So did they identify this to you as their priority? That's what I'm trying to determine. Yeah, well, that they are, they, are, so they are working on this project at the moment. This money will go towards that project. Um, uh, but it's been indicated time and time again that one of the reasons both in the state government at a council level and in the sector itself is a lack of political leadership in addressing this issue. Um, uh, and so we need to send a clear signal that we are open to uh, to policies and solutions that address this issue that comes up every year. So, Councillor, that's that bit. With regards to the uh, definition of original mobility and transient population, um, can I point that to the CEO? 
so through the chair. Um, so um, you may remember, Councillor, in the previous time um, on the council, there was um, always um, some work um, hoping to be progressed in relation to implementation of dry zone um, around ensuring proper cultural um, sensitive um, projects in relation to um, the Aboriginal um, population. Um, the, the intent for the last couple of years has been to um, work on what's called a 90 day project through state government. Um, that has been um, sitting within the um, Adelaide Zero project as a piece of work for I think a couple of years and long can probably confirm. Um, in the last few months, um, Anglicare has now taken the lead on that work. Um, and um, is uh, working quite quickly to try to pull together um, a, a piece of work that does help understand and address the Abor Aboriginal mobility. Um, in terms of the trans, what's the other part, the transient population? I think that's terminology um, from within the IGH report, but I'd need to clarify um, for you, which I can do tomorrow. Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thank you. Look, um, you you spoke of, you oh, speak. I actually asked questions. I just want to speak. No, no, you can't stand. speak. You've spoken already. When you raise the motion. The oh, moved. when I move the amendment. Correct. Oh, okay. So you can ask questions, but you can't All right. speak. Councillor Martin. Uh, yes, a question for the administration. Um, given that the administration has recommended to us that we note the visit of Dr Noni Brennan, co-author of the IGH report, and the intention of Dr Brennan to work with Adelaide Zero Project partners to progress planning and implementation of other Adelaide Zero Project deliverables captured in the February report, which may result in opportunities to allocate to the room the remainder of the $200,000, why, if that is your position, have you not recommended to us the allocation of $60,000 to the Zero project for the funds to be budgeted uh, uh, to fast track the existing work being done on Aboriginal mobility? And a whole range of other projects sitting within the um, IGH report. So um, I think there's $1.2 million worth of projects sitting within that report. Um, it's up to council members to prioritise where that 200k gets delivered. Um, and an amendment tonight is recommending 60k to the ACZP for that project. Uh, Chair, may I just ask that if these allocations for parts of particular budgets are put to council committee on the fly, it would be really useful to have some administration comment to provide not only context, but the, the fund, fundamental reason for, the, for agreeing to it. Uh, and what, if we agree to this on, we're missing out on in another part of the budget where we could be helping. The reality as I read it, Councillor, for this, this was politically led. So this was moved in the Chamber of Council and allocated by the political body of Council. Um, and it's been since that administration's feeding back this to committee and council and the political body will make a decision because this initial uh, recommendation or piece of work was not recommended by our administration. It was recommended by the political body. So they don't have a program that they're running with. What they're doing is every time there's a change or a request, they're bringing it back to the chamber to make a decision because this is not an embedded program within our administration. Uh, no, but the point I'm making, Chair, is when it came to the political body, it came to us as an allocation. No, it came as a motion from Councillor. As, as a motion uh, uh, requesting an allocation of $200,000 conditional on state government matching uh, or exceeding that funding. This is not conditional on anything. And so the circumstances have changed completely. Sure. The elected body, the political body, is now being asked to make decisions about where it allocates spending, not where it allocates spending where there is a conditional state government participation. Correct. To have that comment would be useful. Correct, that's valid. Any other remarks with regards to this? Before I put it back to uh, Councillor Hyde, just a couple of remarks. Members, I have no idea what we're fighting about. They're both 
good outcomes that we're delivering to the community. It just happens that the priorities might shift in a specific set. There's councillors that are pushing for a blanket approach for the money to go for the Adelaide Zero project where they can make determination. And there's a councillor that's pushing that the specific uh, project is funded. I think both causes are very worthy to be supported. It's fantastic that this council has shown leadership in putting up $200,000 of funding to address social issues in our community. This is not a political problem. We are doing good. In both motions, we are doing good. Um, so with that in mind, I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm also very baffled. Deputy um, Lord Mayor. Uh, oh, sorry. Sorry, apologies. I mean, I mean council mode already. Um, uh, also very baffled as to what the um, what the argument is about. Uh, it seems incredibly obstructionist, um, uh, purely purely along factional um, lines. The Phil Martin faction, the Anne Moran faction, whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, it. It's very disappointing. But the, the the other side of it, the other side of it, the other side of it goes to the heart of what um, uh, of what I've been told are the issues um, largely with um, uh, transit population use of the parklands, and that is. Um, there has not been the political fortitude um, and the leadership necessary to address this issue. Um, certainly there wasn't in reference to the, the pink papers, as, as Councillor Martin calls it. Um, uh, yes, this issue has been looked at for years and year after year there is no solution. Year after year there is no fix. This year the issue is worse than previous years. This year we may see a doubling or a tripling of the regular people that come uh, and use this. That means more people that need services, more people that need support. I'm saying we put the funding in place to make sure they get that as quickly as possible. Um, uh, and to, to speak against that and instead to suggest that we should just take all our funding and throw it to the breeze, um, uh, I, 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 think is, I think is a response. No, well, that, that is what was being said with releasing the rest of the $200,000. And the way that I read that motion before suggested we release that $200,000 didn't say anything about continued state government funding. Um, uh, so to your point, talking about directing this funds, but but councillors, what this is doing is this is saying, this is admitting that we have a problem and perhaps the reason this hasn't been addressed is because councillors stick their head in the sand and politicians stick their head in the sand, refuse to acknowledge the problem, refuse, Councillor refuse Moran, to acknowledge the problem. You, Councillor Moran, Councillor Moran, Councillor Moran, Moran, Council Moran, 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 let him finish. We will finish quicker. Let him finish. I don't think so, Councillor. Let's continue. Well, you should just say we're sticking our head in the sand. We've been Councillor Moran, we are wasting. Councillor Moran, I'm happy. You've been working on it for years. Councillor, Councillor Moran, please do not provide running commentary. Thank you for defending me. Thank you for defending me to the death. I appreciate it. Councillor Hyde, can you please finish? Um, Oh look, I think I think the point's been made. Um, this is good policy. It's been worked through with all the stakeholders. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't imagine anyone who's voting or who voted for the previous amendment had actually engaged with any stakeholders. Um, oh, so, oh, uh, sorry, stakeholders who will be delivering the work, delivering oh, the work. Um, uh, there was no correction there, and so I endorse the motion to the chamber. Thank you. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is heard. Move on to item 5.5, 2019-20 quarter finance report. I have a recommendation to council. Moved by Councillor Martin. Can I have a second, please? Seconded by Councillor Canole. Any debate? No. Just a couple of Councillor Martin has a couple of questions. Councillor Moran, I have to take those before, as the mover, before you, I can take I a motion from you to be put. He hasn't spoken, he's got the right to speak to his motion before motion is accepted to be put. Come on, I start working with me. Can't, <laughs> <laughs> can't, be, can't be the rules for you, Councillor Moran. <laughs> Councillor Martin, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, look, it's all great. I just have a, a couple of questions. The uh, Jeffcott Street project, has been delayed to some point in the future and savings of one million dollars when has it been delayed to it because it's not apparent from the papers <coughs> and why uh, through the chair it's a carry forward of one million dollars and we're in the hands of sa power networks in terms of the timing of the project so it's completely related to the undergrounding and how that impacts the rest of the project through the chair correct Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And um, at page 70, it's proposed 
that a civic management area plan is to be introduced. What is that, please? Just to clarify through the chair, at page 17? Yeah, it doesn't, there's no detail. It just says that that's on the way, on the right hand column. Thank you. Uh, just it's on the right. Um, look, I might have taken on notice um, through the chair. Um, it is in relation to the Civic Recognition Working Group. Um, there's a plan that's associated with that. There's some projects that are attached to that. I just don't know the, the exact details. Could I, could I have those details up there? Sure. Thank you. And just one final quick question. Why are we allowing Rundle Wall Management Authority to carry forward almost $200,000? Just through the chair to clarify that point, there was a provisional carry forward for the end of year subject to the completion of their audited financial statements. Uh, in line with the uh, charter, they uh, allowed to carry forward any surplus after factoring in uh, capital expenditure. So the uh, final amount is, I believe, 21,000. So uh, they are allowed to do that under the charter. Uh, under their charter? That's correct. But we can object if we wish. No? Okay. Anything else, Councillor? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, I've got a motion from Councillor Moran for a motion to be put. Um, so I have to deal with that first because she flagged it. So, Councillor Moran, do you wish to still go ahead with that? So that's. Uh, can I? I need a seconder for that for the motion to be put. Can't make a formal motion. Sorry. Can't make a formal motion. Yeah, you can't do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Councillor Moran. That's okay. Anyone else want to speak to this uh, councillor? Um, I just had a question, and perhaps I missed it in the document, but um, the efficiency targets that we set for the administration to meet when we uh, ticked off on the budget in its entirety in this current financial year. Um, uh, I know this, there are some things in green that say we're making savings on them, but um, is there an update in here on uh, where we're at meeting those that efficiency target and the money that we needed to balance the budget? Uh, through the chair, we actually provided an update to the last audit committee meeting. Uh, I'm happy for us to look at incorporating that uh, within the next uh, quarterly update uh, for you. Thank you. Uh, broadly speaking, are we on track to meet our, our savings target? Uh, yes, we are. So there are four uh, targets or uh, efficiency things put within the budget. First was uh, 500,000 from general operations that has been achieved. Uh, the second was through the utilities, so there's a net amount of 200,000 on track to achieve that. And then there's one on procurement uh, of net 800,000. Uh, we make progress on that. And then uh, there's a final one regarding business operations of $1.5 million. Uh, and we're making good progress on that too. Thank you. Councillors, any other remarks or questions? Be it that there's none. Councillor Martin to sum up. No, no. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. Members, we're moving on to item 7.1 and we are dealing with items for, oh, sorry, I apologise, item 6. It's not showing on my uh, outline. Um, council member discussion. Is any other items that need to be brought to the attention of the chamber? Yes, may I just raise one, Madam Chair, very briefly? And it is to do with part two and the proposed Crows takeover of the Aquatic Centre. Um, I, I am disturbed that the uh, Adelaide Parklands Authority will be asked this week um, to review a proposal to remove dozens of trees for the purposes of creating additional parking along Prospect Road, the only area which does not have parking around the proposed site for the Crows facility. Um, it is now proposed that there will be uh, trees removed and cars parked both sides 
So the entire block is covered with car parking. Um, it goes to the very point that we're all making, no matter what you think about this, uh, my colleagues, this is yet another signal that this is a done deal. It is entirely inappropriate that it should be contemplated at this time. And moreover, if people feel outraged at the number of trees that are being removed, simply to accommodate car parking, then I invite them to attend the meeting of that one. Thank you, Councillor. You'll have an opportunity. Councillors, councillors, I'm going to have to reiterate again what the purpose of this is. Fortunately or unfortunately, there will be some councillors in this room and it's their view and they're entitled to make a political statement with regards to whatever they wish in this segment. This is what it's designed for. Councillor Kuros, put your hand up. That's the purpose of this exercise. You have no right to respond. You have no right to ask questions. The only people, the only people that can respond and clarify on public record are the administration to clarify any issues with regards to statements made that are untrue, unclear, and they need to be justified. That is it. Is everyone clear on that? Okay. So I need to defer to the CEO with regards to the comments made by Councillor Martin. If there's anything that needs to be clarified, he clarifies on a record and we move on. That's the process. Also tonight, sorry CEO, you cannot also, in this forum, flag that you're bringing a motion to the chamber. You can't flag any of this stuff. This is purely to make a comment, bring a constituent concern to the chamber, to bring something to the attention of administration. That is it. See you. Through the chair, the project that Councillor Martin is referring to is the project that we have negotiated with the state government um, and the city of Prospect. It's to do with part two, and it is a matter um, that is entirely unrelated to the Adelaide Football Club proposal. Um, Clinton, any further advice other than that? Uh, through the chair, in relation to the reference to tree removal, um, there are some trees along the footpath that are planned to be removed um, that will be brought to council. Um, in replacement of those trees, I think there's some additional um, 49 extra trees going in so a net increase in trees and the idea is to formalise the paths along the roadway um, and to my knowledge nothing relating to any parking. Thank you. Well done. Uh, thank you uh, CEO for clarifying that. Uh, is there any other comments? Yeah. Councillor Donovan. This is uh, not related to that. Yeah. Other Perfect, yeah. Something new, fresh, exciting. <laughs> uh, two, two brief points. Um, one meeting that I attended uh, with the Office of uh, Recreation, Sport and Racing, uh, which was a deep dive on getting South Australians active, and it was specifically highlighting active transport. So just a brief summary um, that that meeting involved all of the key stakeholders in that area and was really focused on immediate action. So there'll be a report that's coming out from that uh, comprehensive meeting that looks at what City Council can be doing in addition to the other uh, stakeholders in immediate actions in increasing uh, active transport and that was in particular focusing on kids and safety and uh, noting some of the vast reductions that have occurred with primary school kids in particular in terms of uh, walking and travelling by bike to school. So around the 1950s it was um, at least three times higher than the current rates even though most kids, uh, based on their statistics, live within a 10 to 20 minute walk from school. So there's some uh, some recommendations that are come out, coming out from that. Um, and the other thing was I had the pleasure of attending the uh, LGA AGM. Uh, just to briefly touch on the seven uh, areas that were discussed, the seven endorsed items that were put forward by different councils, a motion requesting stronger regulation of core flute election Signs, a motion noting the October 28 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Special Report and asking that the LGA's policy statement on the topic acknowledge the serious risk and the state of climate emergency and urging all levels of government to prioritise climate change action, noting the motion did actually stop short of declaring a climate emergency. Uh, a request that LGA develop policy for issues relating to predicted increased use of electric vehicles, which of course City of Adelaide already has. 
um, a request for fair allocation of open space funding to take into account those areas experiencing higher volumes of infill development, a request for the LGA to write to the Minister for Planning regarding transition under the new planning and design code of heritage and historic conservation zones and contribut contributory items, um, a request for the LGA to support and seek a review of the impacts of infill development and finally a request that the LGA assist councils in navigating impacts of reform in the aged care sector. Thank you Councillor for your report. Um, any other matters to be brought up by council members? Okay, be it that there's none, I'll move on to the next item, item 7.1, we have an exclusion to deal with three items. Item 8.1, 2019-20 quarter one commercial operation reports. Item 8.2, EOI results of Mills Park, Park 19, Peppermint Park, Widow Wirra, Park 18, and 8.3, Capital City Committee Annual Report, 18-19. I'd ask members to move all those individually. So I'd move first the exclusion for item 8.1, moved by Councillor Hyde. Seconded by Councillor Renta. Is there any discussion with regards to that item? I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. 8.2 EOI results. Um, also to move that exclusion. Uh, moved by Councillor Hyde. Seconded by Councillor Renta. I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. And item 8.3, Capital City Committee Annual Report 1819. I'll put that to the vote for exclusion. Councillor Hyde, seconded by Councillor Renzetta. Any debate? All those in favour? All those against? That is carried. That was actually a le legislative requirement. Yeah. Yeah, that's state of confidence. I would get to Does that mean it's legal? Yeah, we <laughs> Seriously, what a joke. No. Um, if I could ask members of the public and staff that are not directly associated with those items to please remove, to please exit the chamber, and I'll ask for the door to be closed shortly, and then we will switch off the online. Uh,
With that, I declare the meeting closed at 8.18 p.m. And I thank you for your attendance.